morning, everyone. Hi. So we're starting at 10.30 promptly. Uh, we've got a lot to get through today and tomorrow. So um, a very warm welcome to this, the second uh, Beyond the Lab, developing your industrial biotechnology career. And um, so you're going to have to forgive me. I've had some eye problems, and I normally wear contacts, and my glasses don't let me read. So I have created my own very vocals. So I know it looks a bit odd. Kate has assured me we're not being videoed, so it's okay. Only you guys will see how silly it looks. So, uh, first of all, a very warm welcome, and thank you all for coming and attending. Uh, we appreciate there are a few people still to come. There's been some major train problems, I think, between Leeds and, and York this morning, so, um, so we know there's a few more people on their way who will join us during the morning. So, so this conference has been organised by the um, Industrial Biotechnology Leadership Forum and it's supported by Cogent Skills and I think the main thing, it's funded by eight of the BBSRC networks in IB. I'm Jenny Lucas, I work for Cogent Skills, I'm Head of Operations uh, and I've been part of the organising team uh, for this conference. Uh, the big person who's the organiser is Kate that many of you have met and she is your key and most important woman over the next two days if you have any issues or problems. So what's this conference about? So its origins were about um, skills, but not so much the, uh, the academic skills and practical skills that you all undoubtedly have in buckets and spades. This was more about some of the skills you might need as you move on in your careers, but also about where that career might be and to open up what the options might be and maybe to help some of you think more widely. If you've come through a route that's been fairly academic so far, and that's certainly where I started, um, it's sometimes hard to see where you go beyond the lab. And so these two days, as much as they can be, are a taster of... So what are the types of organisation you could go and work for? Different sizes, different types, uh, employers, some of the stakeholder organisations. Um, what are the different types of roles that there might be? There's some workshops this afternoon that do some of that. Uh, and also, what will people be looking for beyond your academic knowledge and skills? Um, and if you talk to some of us who've been out in industry and some of the representatives here, they're also looking at some of those interpersonal skills as well. And they really matter in terms of actually how you then work and um, operate within your various careers going forward. Um, I'm sure it goes without saying, but I will really encourage you to get the most out of these two days and grab all the opportunities it offers. And that's about asking questions, not thinking it's a dumb question, because I don't think there ever is. If it's a question, just ask it. Get the information while you're here. Talk to people. Um, make that effort to go and actually grab people. All of us who are here as organisers and speakers are very welcome that you come and talk to us. Um, everyone's volunteered to be here beyond just the sessions they'll do up front, etc. Um, attend the workshops. There's some networking sessions with some of the speakers later this afternoon in smaller groups, maybe five, six. Bit first come, first serve, but at lunchtime there's some sheets on the registration desk, so if you're interested, go and get your name down and you'll get a chance to talk to some of the speakers in a smaller group at that stage. And also just make use of the breaks and the lunch and the dinner tonight. Um, if you're here with some colleagues, try and challenge yourself that you're going to speak to at least three or four strangers while you're here in the, in the next two or three day, two days, etc. Um, and just that part of networking. There'll be a good session tomorrow morning about the power and the importance of networking. Um, and just finally in this bit, um, also a, a big thank you to all of the NIBs who have uh, funded this conference, made it possible, and equally to the sponsors and exhibitors um, for all their help and um, support for this event as well. Um, obviously these things don't happen without some funding behind them, so very grateful for all of that. And I'm thanking on behalf of the IBLF, of which I'm a member. Right, I need to do some of the... Uh, the housekeeping bits now as well. So, um, just so you're aware, there are no planned fire alarms at York University in the next two days. So it's a continuous alarm, and if it does sound, we need to respond to it. Um, I can do my aircraft bit. You know, there are there are exits at both wings, so to speak. 
Uh, obviously, if we're in here, the closest one is out here, and the assembly point is in the car park by the porter cabins in that direction. Obviously, at the other end of the building, there is also uh, fire exits at that end, etc. Um, if anything happens, Kate will be there with staff from York University directing us. Um, we'll hope that doesn't be needed. Um, toilets, there are certainly toilets in this main building in the area where tea and coffee was. Ladies and gents are there. I think I've tried to tell everyone, uh, lunch, dinner, breakfast tomorrow, uh, lunch, are all in the Galleria in the Roger Kirk Centre. Um, can I encourage you to wear your badge at all times, uh, mainly because it's your route to getting food. So it identifies that you're here with a conference and means you'll get fed. Uh, and a couple of you who haven't got badges, you'll make sure you've got badges before that stage, etc. Um, also, your badge indicates the two workshops that you will be attending this afternoon. So if you can um, stick to that, and there will be signs on the rooms where those different workshops are. Um, session one and two today are being recorded. So almost in the form of a, a webinar, you will get that information, as will be the workshops. So if there are workshops you would have liked to attend and didn't get the opportunity, we will circulate afterwards um, the presentations from those workshops, so you'll get that opportunity. Um, as I said, Kate is a key person, uh, and particularly when it comes to those of you who have um, got accommodation tonight. So at lunchtime, if you can go to the registration desk, you'll have been pre-checked in, and Kate will have keys and directions to where you're staying tonight. Um, again, any problems, uh, logistical, whatever, see Kate, please. And I, as I mentioned, the networking for session four is also, you can sign up at the registration desk um, at lunchtime. You all should have been given a pack. If you weren't, I apologise, and please grab one when we go out of here. In there, you get the conference booklet with all the programme. Um, there is something called a, a Belbin questionnaire. Some of you might be familiar with this, um, a sort of team working role questionnaire. There's going to be an intro to that in session four this afternoon, and we're going to ask you to just complete that before tomorrow morning when you'll get a little bit more information. And it's part of this thinking about your more interpersonal skills and preferences uh, as part of this conference. Um, if you need them, there's also a list of some taxi numbers. So if you needed a taxi for when we close tomorrow, please book that tomorrow morning. And those of you who have indicated you have dietary requirements or allergies should have a little card that you can give to your server at dinner tonight to make sure that your dietary requirements are met. So that was um, rather a lot of the housekeeping, but get that all out of the way. So just before we go into the, uh, the first of our, um, our speakers for this morning, um, those of you who looked at the program will see there's the word icebreaker, which is always a word to put fear and dread into conference attendees. Um, and if I was sat with you, I'd be thinking, what the hell is she going to ask me to do? So. Um, so I want to do a couple of things really quickly, just to get some energy in the room. So the first one might be a bit weird, and I've never done it before, but I thought I'll use you as guinea pigs. You know, you're coming through academia, you know, you should be used to trying out new things. So we're all here, we all made it here. Um, I've actually been lost twice this morning, which is remarkable for me, but I, I find your campus quite difficult to find my way around. So, I want us to all stand up and just applaud the fact that we've made it here and we're here and we're going to get the most out of the next two days. So just stand up and give yourselves a round of applause. And secondly, and this is really quick, so we've only got about five minutes, and I don't know how it will work logistically, because if you've come with people you know, I bet you're sitting next to them. But try and find someone that you don't know, and very quickly share with them what to date has been your favourite or your best experiment that you've done, and really quickly, what was the one that went wrong or didn't work or failed? Because we've all got one. I, mean, I, I, I still remember spending months synthesising these crystals under carbon monoxide, growing single crystals so you could do crystallography, and somebody turned off the carbon monoxide over the weekend. <laughs> So, very quickly, you've got about five minutes, find someone if you can that you don't know, and just talk about, so what's your favourite experiment today, what's worked well for you, and if you got failure, what was that? Go. <laughs>
So I'm afraid your your five minutes are up. Thank you very much. So you can give me some feedback afterwards whether you thought that was, uh, was good or uh, bad or indifferent. Um, but it certainly put a bit more energy in the room before you, I guess, you're involved in more of a listening mode than involvement mode. So that was good. So uh, just to reiterate, for this morning we're in this lecture theatre. Um, we'll move on to our keynote speaker and then we've got a session on working for different types and sizes of organisations. The first session this afternoon, which will then be repeated as the workshops, and there'll be three rooms further down in this building for A, B and C workshops. So when you come back after lunch, we're not back in here, you'll be in one of the workshop rooms. So what I'd like to do next is in, um, introduce our keynote speaker. Um, and I'm delighted that we have uh, Simon Dewar with us. Um, you have his biography in your packs, but most recently he's head of R&D operations at Fujifilm Diasynth uh, Biotechnologies. Uh, based up in the northeast in um, Billingham and Redcar. And Simon has responsibility for all research and development activities on both of the sites that Fujifilm has in that area. Um, and he brings a vast amount of 29 years' experience um, in the industry with this company and its predecessors. So it's my, uh, my pleasure to ask Simon to come and talk to you this morning. Thank you. Hi everybody, it's uh, nice to see you all here today and I hope I can try and keep some of the energy in the room after a, a great icebreaker there, so thank you for that and for meeting George here, that was great to, to meet the, the first of you. Um, so I'm, I'm here today, I'm standing in for uh, my CEO actually, Steve Bagshaw, who was due to be here today, um, but Steve actually misspoke I think when he said he was going to be here today, what he really meant was he wasn't going to be here today, so um, I think he's, he's, he's learning from the best on that I think. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, other options in your career other than just staying in academia as well. And so the little bit things I'm going to talk about today are a little bit about myself and my company so you can see the, the, uh, the strange career I've taken that probably wasn't anything like how I started off expecting to be taking. Um, a little bit about why all of you in this room are in a brilliant position because this, this industry is growing like crazy at the moment and I think you're in a really good position to take advantage of that. Um, a little touch that we've already mentioned a few times this morning about soft skills and how um, these soft skills are probably much more important than you think you are at the moment. I always thought these were just soft and therefore not important. They're probably as important as your technical knowledge as well as your career grows. Uh, and then talk about a few of your options. Um, you have a ton of options open to you. You can do whatever you like really uh, in, in your careers. So keep your mind open and, and listen to and talk to a lot of the people around you today and see, see if anything interests you. Uh, and then just a few closing thoughts at the end. So, when Steve asked me to do this, I thought, oh, I remember being in that position a long, long time ago. Um, and, you know, when I was doing my PhD or doing my, my degree, this is what I looked like. And you can see, in those days, everything was kind of sepia coloured. Um, <laughs> things weren't colourful like they are these days. So, everything had that sort of funny tinge to it. and. Uh, and everything looked old. I mean, look at that desk. You know, this was so. This was when I started at a company called ICI. ICI, for those of you who are too young to know, it used to be a really big company in the UK. It was one of the biggest manufacturing companies. I think it was the biggest manufacturing company in the UK uh, at the time I started. So it was this massive company, and I thought, oh great, I'm working for ICI. Um, so I started there with my funny little lab coat on there, with my badge on there, my proud round up sitting in my office. Uh, but I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the history of. Um, what, what, how my career went on from there. So you can see it's a, um, a history of a few different companies, but largely all roughly in the same desk that you just saw there. So I started off in ICI in 1998, like I say, before most of you were born. Um, and at that stage, ICI, or the bit I was working for, was all about uh, biologics and making big things in chemostats. So making lots of cells, growing tons and tons of cells very quickly, for making uh, optically pure herbicides, for making all sorts of chemicals, biotransformations, plant growth hormones, all sorts of things uh, in big chemostats. So my first chemostat that I got to play with uh, was a, a little five-liter chemostat in the lab. 
But then I went to play on a 15,000 litre one as well at the same time. So I developed a process and then transferred over into a, a decent sized chemist. That was, that was making one and a half tons of cells an hour. Oh, no, two tons of cells an hour. Um, so there were a lot of fun for a new, for a new graduate. Um, and of course, we had much, much bigger chemostats at that time. We had a one and a half million uh, litre chemostat we were making animal food with as well. So there's a lot of knowledge on continuous processing. And it's funny how continuous processing goes around the loop and you know, everyone's wanting to do it again now. So. Um, then I moved on um, and then I, I get a bit itchy feet after a few years and I thought, oh, I'm going to go and do a PhD because uh, I'm being in a lot of it much now. So the company were very kind and said, well, why don't you do it with us? So uh, I went and did a PhD on corn. So for those of you who don't know, corn is a filamentous fungi and how that grows and how you stop that mutating and things was what my PhD was about, linked with the University of Manchester. So that was great. And at the time we were, we were formed a company called Zeneca um, and we could do anything we wanted to as long as it wasn't pharma. So we, we had a separate division that did pharma and it was like hands off, no pharma for you guys, you do everything that's biologic but not pharma. So that was very interesting. We did all sorts of weird stuff. We did uh, nutraceuticals, we did um, beta casein for infant formula milk. We made all sorts of stuff in different sorts of cells in weird and wonderful ways. So a lot of fun. Then on to Avicia. Um, Zeneca merged with Astapor, forming AstraZeneca. Avicia was spun out. So this was a big sort of hodgepodge of companies that were left out of ICI, really. Um, and they wanted to grow us, so they, we started making um, pharmaceuticals then, biologics. And that was brought on GMP, which was a, a, quite an awakening for me. Big um, control and um, regulatory hurdles to, to do, overcome there. But we're really learning it as we're going along there. We had 1,000 litre bioreactor or fermenter, and that was our manufacturing facility. Time went on, and we then were bought by Merck, MSD in, in Europe. Um, and they bought us um, because they just spent a ton of money on um, a company called Glycophy. And Glycophy were there to uh, humanize, um, um, do the glycosylation on proteins from yeast that were like humans, glycosylation patterns. So they told, bought it, spent a load of money developing this technology. And the idea was they were going to develop biosimilars that were made in, in uh, mammalian cells, but they were going to be much cheaper by growing them in yeast. So they're going to express these things in yeast, and they're going to be buttons to sell. What they didn't think before they bought this and bought us was, well, we should talk to the regulators first. The regulators might not want you making these biosimilars in a completely different cell line to Cho. So they didn't really have any great advantage, so nothing much happened with that. At the time, Merck merged with Shearing Plough and then realized, portfolio review, that's not going to work, sell them on to Fujifilm. For some reason, my Fujifilm logo has disappeared there. But anyway. So Fujifilm, though, they've owned us for the last seven, eight years, and they've been a fabulous owner. So, we bring in much more mammalian cell culture technology now, and they've invested very, very heavily in our side. Uh, and we'll continue to grow. Last year, they said, we really like what you're doing, you're really growing nicely. But I tell you what, over the next five years, uh, can you, I think it was more than quadruple, actually, quadruple in size, please. We want four, five times the amount of sales in the next five years, please. So they've got a big investment plan and, and uh, great aspirations for us. So over this career, I started off as a lab scientist, I then went down to one of my favorite roles, actually. This was a technical project leader role. And this was a role where you get all the different functions within a, the company to work together as little independent teams, and you work on a molecule yourselves. And you maybe have a year to work on this. So this little team sits together and works uh, on developing a project, developing a molecule for a customer, working out how to make it, and then go and manufacture it, and then go to clinical trials. So that was a lot of fun. And that was a, a good role I had in the industry. Then I had a really outside my comfort zone. I decided this R&D stuff's great, but you know I really like people and I get on with people very well. Um, why don't I go and um, do some program management? And program management, ooh, that's a bit of a funny, funny role. So I had no formal training in program management at all. People were asking me about the sales and SNOP process, and probably you're responsible for that now, Simon. Well, am I? I don't even know what it stands for. So um, I was miles out of my comfort zone, but I learned a ton of stuff working in that program management role for a while. So I looked after that group for about two years, uh, learned a load of stuff, miles out of my comfort zone, but really, really good fun. Looking back, it was really good fun anyway. And then finally, I, for the last couple of years, I've headed up at the R&D group up in Billingham and Wilton. So that's a little story about me. Uh, the company itself, um, we have four sites, you can see. In the, the bottom, your bottom right-hand corner, you'll see that that's the Billingham site. So there's about 500 of us on there. 
Um, about 190 scientists on there working within my group, developing customers' molecules, developing medicines that are actually going to go and change people's lives. We're expanding so quickly, um, we wanted to make some more labs. We've got no space in our lab anymore, we wanted to expand it really quickly. So we've leased and refurbished some new labs down there, uh, down at Wilton, which is about 15 miles away. So the expansion goes on, there's about another 30 people down there, down there now, and they're really taking the best way we think you can make monoclonal antibodies and try to make this as a real sort of efficient platform. So we have everything robotic that we can do robotically, um, we have our preferred platform way of making this thing, and we're trying to rattle through making maps and making monoclonal antibodies as cheaply and as effectively and as quickly as possible. To transfer over to this place here, which is our third site, which is over in Texas, so Texas have just built and building this enormous big manufacturing facility where they're going to have 12 2,000 litre single-use bioreactors making monoclonal antibodies for customers. Um, so they're going to have up to 12 of these different <coughs> molecules going at any one time in, in that facility. And then our sister company over in North Carolina, which is very much like Billingham site, um, doing the same sort of mix between microbial and mammalian expression of recombinant proteins. So that's the company today, but as I say, we're expanding like crazy. Um, and it's a, it's a lot of fun at the moment. So growth. Our industry, your industry, if you want to move into the industry, is growing like mad. Um, the thing that we struggle with most is to get the smart people. Bringing in new smart people like you uh, is really a, a real, real challenge. Um, and all of our four sites are recruiting. I've been recruiting now constantly for about the last two years. Um, we're just getting bigger and bigger. We'll have taken in R&D, probably gone up about 80 in the last two or three years. So it's a real challenge bringing in people, getting equipment, getting labs, and all the rest of these things. But the, the, the easy bit is buying equipment. Everyone says, well, how are you going to fit? Well, you just need money to buy equipment. You've got to buy the right stuff, of course you do, and you need to, you need to have somewhere to put it. So you then need to make some labs. Making labs is harder than I thought it was going to be, but uh, still some quite good fun building some new labs. But it's okay, making labs. But the real tough stuff is uh, recruiting people, recruiting good people when you're growing at the rate we're growing and getting teams that still have that same sort of coherence between them, working well as a team, that's a real challenge. And it's something um, we've learned a lot of over, over the last few years and I'd just like to share some of the things we've learned over the last few years on, on how to make that better. So we need smart people who aren't just going to do what we do now, the same next year, we need to find better ways of doing these things more efficiently. What our owners don't want us to do and what the market doesn't want us to do is just replicate everything. Because anyone can just do more and more. We need to find smarter ways of doing these things. Um, and we need bright, smart people with new ideas to, do, to tell us how to do that and work out how to do it. But then it comes on to the softer skills. Um, I was talking earlier on about um, this sort of breakaway group that we've got down at Wilton, the second, second level, um, group of labs that we have down there, where there's about 25 or 30 people down there. It's going to be going up to about 50 people in, in total. The last thing I wanted down there is to have the sort of uh, an, out, an outpost of, uh, of Fujifilm down there, where a different culture develops all together. It's some sort of feral group that go off, off, off the grid somehow, you know? So we wanted the group down there to be just as it is in Billingham, just as it, the culture is in Billingham, and, and work in the same ways and have the same strengths. So we've really worked hard on trying to build these teams. And these teams, to build a good team, really, you need some really good soft skills. Um, so, I think with all of these sort of soft skills, one of the first things you've got to do is, is honest appraisal of yourself. I think to understand your strengths, your weaknesses, your personality traits, um, and, and understand, you know, are you extrovert, are you introvert, um, where you get your energy from, do you need to be with people, do you need to be alone? Because um, if you don't understand yourself, it's much harder to understand other people as well, I think. We've been through a few exercises recently at work. Um, We've done Belbin profile of everyone, and I'm really glad to hear that you're all doing Belbin later on. Belbin's a fascinating insight into how you work as a person and how your teams work as a person. So we did the leadership team at Billingham recently. We did Belbin profiles of us all, and we mapped it out on a huge, huge piece of paper and where the different people sit and things. And it was really insightful for me to say, oh, now I know why I don't really, I really struggle with her uh, and why we mean you know, her get on really, really well and all the rest of these things. It was really insightful to, to understand the differences and understand where other people are coming from. So it was a really useful tool. So be really open with your, your questionnaire that you're going to do later on. That'll be really good. The other thing we did is 
we have, as I said, we've got four sites now, and we want to be seamless. And to all our customers, we want to be one company. And of course, it's a little bit of a marketing spin out of seamless because we're all very different. But we all got together earlier on in RTP, North Carolina, in March, I think, we said, oh, we, a little icebreaker, what we should do is we do a, um, a Myers-Briggs profile of the whole team. So one of the guys over there said, uh, I don't know what we'll do, we'll do Myers-Briggs, but Star Wars based. So we'll do all the pro personality profiles, and when you get your personality profile, it'll be aligned to one of these different Star Wars characters. Um, and, it, and it was a little, it was really interesting to do, and uh, a lot of fun. It was a little disappointing, the, the profile that I got, so, uh, I really wanted a, like a cool character, and I definitely didn't want this guy down here. Um, well, no one wants that guy. But I ended up being with these ENTPs, that it's an R2D2, and I thought, oh, that's not a very cool character, is it? Um, um, you know, so I, I did it a few times just to see if I could try and you know, get, a better, get a better character. Uh, and I still kept coming out as R2D2, so I was a bit gutted, really. When we got there, we did the grand reveal. Our team, there's a lot of R2D2s in our team, and what that means is really these are inventors, these are people who get bored easily, these who move on and like to be with people and all the rest of these things. What it means in our team is we never get anything done. If you're not careful, you'll stop a ton of things and you'll have a ball. Um, but you know what, you need some people who are going to finish things, you're going to have people who are into the detail and all the rest of those things. So it's a bit of a worry that we've got so, more, so many RTT2s. Um, so be careful when you're building a team, not too many RTT2s or the Lord of the Sith, or whatever the other ones are as well. So, you know, a balanced approach is best, I think it's fair to say. But, you know, recognize yourself in these things. These are your personality traits. These are your preferences. They're not, you're fixed in that way. They're just your preferences. It doesn't mean, if you're not a complete finisher, you can't ever finish your report. You know, you just got to push yourself to do it. But recognize that's your preference, I think it's fair to say. Okay, um, and it's really, really important when you're, when you're building a team, especially when you're building new teams like we were doing down at Wilton. Then there's a few other things that we, uh, we cherish at Billing, I think. And when we were first owned by Fujifilm, we got these things, and we, there's a bit of eye rolling and things, and things. Oh, really Genki? What is this Genki you speak of? Um, what Genki really means, or we take to mean, is enthusiasm. If you're going to do a job, do it with some enthusiasm. Get stuck in. Don't just sit there and do half-hearted. Really go for it, I think. I think that's really important to really go for these things. The other thing is Gemba, and Gemba's a term that they use in the world of Lean Six Sigma and, uh, and Lean Manufacturing. But what we mean by Gemba is, if someone comes and says, oh, you know what, Simon, the, uh, the, uh, the chromatography's just failed that you've been doing. Well, don't just sit at your desk and have them explain it to you and don't know why it's failed. Go and have a look. Go and stand by the machine that's failed. Go see. Uh, understand uh, the, the perspective that person's coming from and learn from it as well. So I think that's another really important thing to try and do. Okay, and I think teams really matter. And I just stole this from a course I was on recently, and I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to show this for copyright, so I'll probably get into trouble if I ever show anyone. Uh, but this is a really nice illustration of why a team is really important. I think. You know, no, not one of us is as smart as all of us together. You know, if you put a good team together, you can do amazing things. So developing teams are really important. And as you grow in your career and you get to look after bigger teams and grow in bigger groups, remember that you know teams are really, really powerful. So options you guys have. You've got so many options. Um, this sector is growing, it's going to carry on growing, uh, and with the growth, you're going to have lots of options, uh, and you should try and take them. When I look back at that sepia-colored photo uh, at the start of this presentation, uh, my career seemed to go on forever. I thought, you know, it's, it's effectively never-ending. It goes on to, to infinity. Um, looking back, it seems a lot shorter. So, be a little bit impatient as well. So, you know, you think you've got forever to do things, don't put it off. Be a little bit impatient, go for things when you, when you get the opportunity. Um, so I, I've just got some examples of things that within our company um, would be available to you, but within a lot of companies these things are available where we need smart biosciences to do these things. So I mentioned earlier one, project leaders, one of my favorite roles, I think. Small teams of motivated people having problems to solve, solving them, making the medicine at the end of it, that's really quite, quite rewarding, so I really enjoyed that. Data scientists. This Wilton lab, the amount of data that churns out now, the amount of information that we get from all this automation things is phenomenal. Data is one thing, but proper knowledge is another thing. So getting people who understand how to sift through all this data and make sense of all this data is really, really important. And that's a group that's really growing in our, our you know, data science group. Um, commercial account managers, salespeople really. 
Sales was always a bit of a dirty word. There's a lot of fun to be having in technical sales when you're working with other technical people. They come in with problems, they say, oh, you know, you want to make this protein here, you want to have this glycosylation site, you want to have a peg, leg, a peg stick on here. They've got to work out what a customer wants, how to make that molecule, write a proposal on how they're going to, uh, how we're going to do it for them, get the resource levels right, get the cost right, work out how long it's going to take, when they can get it to the clinical trial. There's a lot of really inf in interesting things to do in these roles, so don't discount sales or technical sales. I think it's a lot of fun to be had there. Acquisitions. We're going to have to go grow by five times in the next few years. We'll do a lot of that organically, but we're going to have to buy some other companies. You can't just do that all organically. To buy other companies, you need to know what they're doing, you need to understand the technology they've got and things. So there's all going to be roles for you guys in this sort of thing as well. Quality. We've got some quality representatives. I don't know if they're here yet, are they? Maybe not. From Fujifilm. The quality is a massive thing in, in our company and many other companies. Um, quality again, it's not about just checking boxes and things. It's really about um, understanding processes and knowing what's acceptable for quality and what's not acceptable for quality, either QA or QC. Training, we all need training people. We have the amount of in input we've got at the moment, we can't support all the training needs that the new staff have. So we're looking out for external resources to do that. If we could do it internally, we would. But uh, again, there's a deficit in the in that area. Innovation leaders, this is a lot of fun, especially for, uh, for scientists, I think. So most companies like us, or most companies have a little group of people that they have sort of scrolled away for these sort of skunk work projects where they want to go and uh, have something that, um, increases the offering of the company have. So we have a, a group of people who just work on innovation projects at any one time. And they're looking at ways to make things better, to make things more uh, swiftly, working with other suppliers like GE or Sartorius or something, working how we can have their bits of kit make bespoke for us. Uh, bringing in new technology, do we want to do continuous chromatography, do we want to do continuous um, whatever it is. Um, so there's a lot of fun to be having these innovation roles as well. Um, but understanding that the, the industry is really important for that. Patent attorney, I think there's someone will be talking about patent attorneys later on today, so I won't cover that. Um, marketing communication, again, vital, something we've really skipped over the years, but uh, again, you need to know your science to be able to market the science, so opportunities there. So th there's millions of roles for you out there if you're interested in it. You can make a great career. So I'm almost out of time. I just wanted to give, for what it's worth, a little bit of closing advice, I think, for all of you. Um, I don't there's ever been a better time for being a, a bioscientist. I think... Um, I feel a little bit like one of those um, sorry-looking footballers from, uh, from the 70s or 80s now who look back at the new Premier League stars and see the bright future they've all got ahead of themselves. Uh, so I think it's a really, really good time for you to all be bioscientists. It's really changing the industry. Uh, and you look from where I've come from, growing big pots of uh, Pseudomonas putida, making a, you know, a um, dehalogenase enzyme to making uh, MABs and all these other proteins. This industry changes all the time, and you need to keep up with it. So. Uh, Follow, follow the bits you enjoy. Uh, the science is really important, and you're all great scientists, I have no doubt, but it isn't everything. You've got to learn your soft skills as well, and you've got to take time to understand teams and build teams and all those things, especially as you get more senior. Um, you have tons of choices. Your career is going to go on a long time. You know, you're, you're all very young, you're going to be working for a long time yet. You have lots of choices. If you're not enjoying something, Try something else. You can always move back around. It's not a straight path you're going to follow. I'd be amazed if any of you follow a straight path. Um, and you'd be better at it. And you'd enjoy yourself. So the main thing, I think, is with your, your, your working life is to enjoy yourself. If you do something that you enjoy, you'll do it really well. That's all I have to say. So thank you very much for your, for your time. Yeah, any questions at all? Thank you very much. I think that was an excellent intro to what we're going to cover in the next two days. So it really set the scene well. Um, are there any questions? I'll encourage you. Take the opportunity. Don't be shy. Yeah. Yes? So when you move from one company to the other, you actually, it's the company that was bought, so you didn't have people to interview, or did you actually do? No, just transfer. Almost always just transfer. Um, so sometimes, um, even within the company now to change roles, we now we have the interview, we have to advertise internally and externally. But a lot of those were company uh, owners changes and the, the roles transferred over. So. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned that you were doing a lot of research. How would you think it would be the best way to, to highlight those soft skills that you think are so important? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I can just get back to it. 
I find um, reviewing CVs increasingly difficult, to be honest. Um, a long time ago, CVs were written by the person who, who was applying for the role. Um, many more times now, the CV is a, a completely impersonal, written by somebody else document that has many, many keywords in. So most of us scan through. We look for someone at least shows an appreciation of soft skills. A lot of people don't even mention soft skills, so I think at least you know, call out that we think teamwork's important, um, work with others, understanding self, understanding others. Call those things out. Don't just talk all technical, you know? I think we're looking for humans here. We're not looking for, for robots. We want people who are going to work with a team. The last thing you want, um, and we spend a lot of time in the interview doing is trying to pull out those softer skills from people. So um, I won't tell you this one example. We do have uh, tasks that we do that we put interviewees through, sorry, uh, that we put interviewees through to try and see the real person. After we did this um, Myers-Briggs thing a couple of weeks ago, we all went out, the same team that night went out and did one of these escape room things. And um, everyone played nicely until the time was getting tight towards the, the end of the hour. <laughs> towards the end of the hour, the true colours came out and there was real trouble. You know, there was one guy, leave me alone, I know what I'm doing, I'm getting on with this, and it was, it was no fun at all, you know, so, so yeah. Just express it on your CV, I think. Just put it up there, along with all your technical skills as well, that they're important things. Yeah. I, think, I think it's about thinking outside the box. You know, you're involved in a network um, as part of being here. So obviously in that network, you may be interacting with other people. There'll be opportunities and examples. Anything you do, I'll call it outside of the lab. You might be involved in societies or other organisations. You might play a role in those. So it's bringing in and thinking quite widely about all of those examples where it's not just your skill and ability at the lab bench and all that knowledge you carry in your head, but all those other things. And they're the examples that these guys would be looking for, that then, you know, if you're equal on everything else, it's those softer skills that will often lift you above the mainstream. And I think a lot of the technical skills, you know, we can, uh, we can teach a lot of those technical skills. The other things are much harder to teach. So, um, you know, especially when you get to interview, you know, emphasize those soft skills you've got and use all the tricks at your disposal. Um, you know, if you've been here today and um, you've met some of the guys from Fujifilm, you want to apply there, tell people that because you're looking through millions of CVs. You're trying to look for things that are going to stand out. No, we had a, um, a guy from Leeds University recently. Um, he'd been there for 25 years, um, and he's transferred, and he's about 50, 50 something now. This guy, he's always worked in academia, always moved into industry, and loves it. So no age gap, no uh, ceilings at all. We just want good people. Okay. Okay. That's super. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. So we're going to go into uh, the first of our sessions now around um, working for different types of companies. Um, so an opportunity to hear about working for some of the big boys, but maybe, you know, right down to something that's very fast and fleet of foot. And also some of the organisations that actually work with the industry and support them. What I'd like to do first is introduce Yvonne Armitage, who's going to chair the next session, um, who has a very distinguished background in uh, industrial biotechnology. Um, so Yvonne is the bioeconomy specialist at the KTN, part of the Innovate UK family, um, and heavily involved in looking at um, strategy and business direction for the industry, um, working with both government, um, particularly she facilitates and works, I think does all the work for the IBLF, I will say that in public, um, but also works very hard at connecting um, connecting industry, people, academia, etc. in this area. So I think um, has a vast array of, of experience and knowledge to tap into in her own right, as well as chair of this next session. And um, we'll be around um, until about five-ish today. So if you, if you want to talk to Yvonne, grab her while she's here. So thank you very much, Yvonne. Thank you. So, sorry, I brought my phone. It's not because I'm wanting to check my emails. It's because I don't wear a watch. And uh, as chair, I thought I'd take a, 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 the opportunity to just do a couple of slides, actually, in terms of my own kind of plan. So this, this slide here is just uh, uh, 
on the left-hand side of the screen, that's where I want to be, that's where in my head I am. But actually the reality is I, I'm the other person sort of thing in terms of trying to juggle too many things. So thank you very much, Jenny, for saying all those lovely things. Uh, so I spent the best part of 20 years working in industry. Um, I loved it. I kind of climbed, climbed a, a greasy pole. I worked in research mostly. I've, I've worked in Switzerland. I've worked in Germany. I've worked for a few different companies. Um, of different sizes, mostly large companies, and it was a lot of fun, that's what I will say. I've then spent seven years working uh, as part of the Innovate UK family, which again is a great job. I love my job, I love science and I love talking about it, so that's why I've got a stopwatch, because I've only got five minutes. So, in terms of as a scientist, obviously, I'm, I, I mean, I was lucky enough to be um, an industry-sponsored PhD student, so actually I got exposed to industry, so I definitely knew I wanted to go and work in industry. Um, but it's interesting how we always view, so you maybe think the grass is greener or people see each other in certain ways. So obviously as an undergrad, you probably see PhD students and postdocs as well. Wow, that's so cool, they don't have exams, they don't have modules, blah, blah, blah. And it's interesting how we all view each, you know, the other, other side of, uh, of life as, as differently. So in terms of, so going into the industry, this is a program that used to be on Cartoon Network for those people that do it. I actually thought it was going to be very different working in an industry lab, but the reality was, you know, I was working in research and I, I was lucky enough to work in corporate research for quite a few years, so I was working on very long-term projects. So it was actually a lot of fun. You know, I expected to be much more serious, shall we say, than academia, but it, it, it was fab. Um, so I remember the day I had my first patent, you know, being classed as an inventor. I sent it to my mum. She had absolutely no idea what it said, but she was very, very impressed as well that this was there. So doing biology in the chemical industries is pretty much where I spent all, all of my time. So yeah, you remember that, you know, you're opening your media bottles and things like that in industrial biotech. So I did spend all my time doing industrial biotechnology as, as, as my career pretty much until I went to do business development. Uh, but it wasn't even called industrial biotechnology when I, when I did it sort of thing. So, you know, when I've said, you know, for more than 25 years, I know I was a child genius. I started very, very young. So in terms of my skills, so a bit similar to um, uh, Simon, Simon's career is, um, you know, effectively I, I did everything from discovery of biocatalysts all the way through to, to large scale um, process development through onto, onto large scale uh, development. I did manage a bunch of chemists, it's fair to say. They probably could run rings around me because I spent all of my time doing biology. But hey, it was fine. It was a lot of fun to kind of be exposed to things that you don't necessarily understand fully, but you know you've got you know really smart people that you're working with that do. And, and grant writing, so I looked after external um, activities as, as well for the organisation. So we did a lot of collaborative uh, research projects. So when I came to the current role I'm in, that hopefully stood me in good stead because I had a background, a technical background for the role that I first started doing, as well as actually that ability to be able to write grants and know what assessors were looking for to, to help advise companies, which is to a certain extent what I do now. Actually, the reality is, this picture, so we have Ali from the Royal Society of Biology. I was lucky enough last year to, to, to be speaking at New Scientist Live. If you've not been to New Scientist Live, go. It's fab. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's a really, really good uh, event. So I got asked to, to do a, a Meet the Biologist role. So I spend most of my time talking for a living, which suits me just fine. Um, hidden skill, crazy cat lady. If you want to know about cat whispering, I've got three cats come and talk to me because I'm really good at that actually, it's, you know, having that conversation as well. Don't just restrict it to people, I also speak to cats. Um, I've just got a couple of slides here, this is just really to reiterate what um, Simon's been saying is, you know, we are really, really good at kind of invention in the UK and, it, and, and actually we're always considered not so good at commercialisation, but actually I think most countries, if you listen to them, say that as well. But particularly if we're looking at bioscience, you know, we are really, really good at, at doing bioscience and, and industrial biotech is definitely a growth area, as Simon's already told you, and I'm sure the guys that, you know, my five speakers are going to tell you exactly the same thing. So, trust me, there are jobs both in academia and in industry as well. Um, so just some facts and figures, uh, again, in terms of, of where we're positioned and, and, you know, the attractiveness in terms of the support that we get from the government. These slides, I'm assuming Jenny will be available, so I'm not going to kind of go into a huge amount of, uh, of detail in each and every one. Um, hopefully you're all familiar that the UK has an industrial strategy for which um, research and science in general it, it is a big part. Um, it has five foundations uh, as a class, that people, 
and place are really important in this, and ideas as well. So people, you know, we're wanting to invest in people, get people to be skilled and, and, and enter the workplace with the necessary skills. Um, grand challenges, you can see here, industrial biotech, so bioscience can play a big part in, in all of these um, grand challenges. Uh, Again, this is, if you like, my, my take to a certain extent of, of that softer skills and, yes, the technical. So for me, also, as an employer, I've looked at lots of people's CVs. Yes, it's, um, you, you know, you've got that, the scientific skills, but actually it is that. What else have they been doing? What do they do in the spare time that means that they can fit into the team properly? Um, science um, industry partnership, uh, looking at the areas uh, that we need people, there's potentially going to be a shortage, so microbiologists, uh, bioinformaticians, definitely a, a need going forward with all the, you know, the sort of the data driven um, activities that we have. So in terms of, you could argue, well actually, you know, the traditional bench scientists, no, we're still going to need people that are wearing a lab coat and looking harried and walking like this. But actually, there's a whole range of other sort of scientific careers we can, we can be doing. So on that, that was, um, yeah, okay, six minutes as opposed to my five minutes intro. But I've got five wonderful speakers and I was so nervous at the beginning when I had three sitting there. Um, so we, we're going to have a, a, a series of speakers that are going to talk to you about their, their different backgrounds and, and, and the experience they have in working with different sides of companies and, and, and different organisations, whether it be public funded or, or private. And so our first speaker is Will Cannon from Croda. And because they're all going to be talking about themselves, hopefully a little bit, um, I don't need to talk any more about you, but I do know these guys. So thank you very much, Will. Right, let's see whether this works because one thing about working for a multinational is that the marketing departments make sure that any type of font you use doesn't normally work on anybody else's computer. <laughs> Yvonne, I work with Yvonne on the IBLF. I should say I work for Yvonne on the IBLF. Um, she does do all the work. She does send all the work out an hour yeah. Uh, before the meeting, we can always guarantee it will be there. So how you deliver things, so I guess you are a, a P at the end of Myers-Briggs, not a J. I mean, there's a hazard, I guess, in the type of personality profile. Me, I'm going to out myself. I am a chemist. I apologise <laughs> in this group. I am a laggard rather than the future. <laughs> the relevance for me though is that I was a chemist by education only. I've had 22 years in industry and only been in a lab to pick up samples. So I think this point is, is poignant for me and I'll cover a bit about our business bit more about me and maybe put into some areas, picking on Simons, ENTPs, I'm an R2D2. Actually in our business, we look for more R2D2s. Good. Uh, so if any of you don't want to work for Fujifilm Dyson and being an R2D2 and being one of many, come work for us where you'll be valued as individuals. <laughs> That's what you get for being able to speak afterwards. <laughs> so, who are we? We're known about, as a company, we're a Yorkshire based company. It's fine to be in York, I suppose. So, I sit on the, the steering group for BioVail for the bioeconomy that's hosted out of York for this region. Um, we are, as the crow flies, 15 miles south of here. As a, a UK chemical company that most people have never heard of. We quietly get on with our business and we quietly grow. Um, we do that by our dedication to innovation and all of it is driven by people. So who are we? Just to give you an aspect of, of size and scale, we sell a billion pounds worth of materials a year, we make some money. What they like, as the investors like, is new and patented products. So, account for roughly a quarter of our business. 
So this just shows about the, the level of innovation and the traction of innovation in the market. We have a market capitalization of six and a half. So we're worth, sorry. We are worth, if you wanted to go buy us, or try to buy us, you'd have to stump up six and a half billion pounds. Or, or that's what the, if you buy shares, if you wanted to buy us, you'd actually have to stump up closer to eight billion to get us. So as long as none of you got there, because we are fiercely want to stay independent. We're in 34 countries, 54 operation manufacturing and sites. We have seven regional manufacturing innovation centers, more now than these application centers around the world. Any country that have people in it, we have a tendency to be there. So, what do we do? Well, we make ingredients. Have any of you, because I have to ask this question, because it's still, albeit, you know, later stage students, you still have some aspects of studying. Have any of you used shampoos or shower gels in the last week? <laughs> <laughs> Not stereotyping at all. But all those things on the greens list, items of those we may make. So if you've seen the adverts where, hi, I'm the beauty editor of the stars, and the secret to anti-wrinkles is this pentapeptide. We design and make those. Protect them and, uh, and uh, perfect for the boots materials that all got headlines. We're behind that. We're behind many things. But this is where our value is. We support other businesses in making those claims, taking to market. So our innovation is taken and built on by others in South Strap Line. Relevance to IB and why I'm here wanting to engage you guys is because we are applauded as being right at the forefront within our industry of sustainability. This happens to be because our business is being built up on using waste of other industries. Whether it be the earlier chemicals industry that was built on, on tallow, the, the waste fats from the food industry. We took those, brought down, made them into soaps, into detergents, into the reactors. Or for where crude actually started, and that was taking the sebaceous uh, secretion of sheep. So when you wash wool, all the gunk that comes off of it and we turn it into materials, into 97 different materials, that goes into some things, and in, in extremis, into vitamin D3 is the precursor to so that, into uh, uh, steroids required for shrimp farming, all the way through to cholesterol for drug delivery into lipids, and many other materials. So we started on this looking at waste. IB is the next generation of where this goes. So the fossil fuel chemistry, why I say about lag as in the chemistry, our industry is changing. IB will drive that change. It's not massively adopted, it's still niche in the market, but this is as Simon says, it's really on the verge of boom growth. My biggest problem working for a multinational is there's too many people in my business and in the in the higher echelons of my business that do not understand what you guys do. They don't understand what it can offer. So this is why we need more of the people with the innate skills to come through, not just the science, because we always say the scientists is, yes, I know I can do this, but we need it to, the message to come from all the different aspects of the business. So singers want to say, IB is the way forward. I firmly believe it is. So these, you can read on here, these are the things we do. We're making functional materials or actives. We're making the lubricant component additive that ensures that the, the, your energy efficiency of your cars is so much better just because of a small additive in there. Or the lifetime of the, the lubricant is extended so you don't have to change things as much. 
to the coating that goes on to the, the paint to stop mold growth in there, or to enhance the shine, or to remove the solvents that are being put in place. So when you paint, you don't get the little lines of your paintbrush. We put all these type of things in, all the bits that you never realize you needed. That's our job, to look at those. Our business model is rather simple. We talk to our customers, we listen and we ask them, what do you want? It's strange, but many, many companies don't do that. They tell them what they have. So we, we do that, we listen, we go away, we try and make something that provides what they want. We then sell it to them because they like it. We make money. They make money. We get rewarded. Everybody seems to be happy. It's the listening skills. And this comes back to the soft skills. It's that ability to listen, which is so important. Look at this. At the top there, every single one of them says, our people make the difference. Top each and every one of those. It is. You ask, what does a CV? Nobody is employed on their CV. The CV is effective just that extension, like your degree certificates and your postdocs. They don't get you the job. They get you the interview. How you react, interact, and think is, you know, what will get you the job. Now, also be aware of this: you may not get the job, and you might be fabulous. You might be the best at what you do, and you won't get the job. And you wonder why? Because some of us guys might have looked at Belvin, understand it, and we wanted somebody to fit into a team. Now. I'm, Jeremy, a colleague, sat up there and he can attest to this, full of ideas, I really am, of what our business can do and everything like that. I can engage people, I can get them motivated and excited to do it. Left to my own devices, I would get nothing done. Innovation is, you know, is the creation plus the, the, the idea plus the delivery. I forgot or I have an absence of that delivery stage. Right? So if you're going to say work with me and directly, there's to be a team. I want to look at somebody who looks at delivery. Gone are the days where you want to employ somebody who is the mirror image of yourself. That does not mean success. So take it guys, if you ever do go for interviews and don't get the job, it's not because you it might not be because you're not fabulous. It's because there's some attribute there that your skills might have to So, on getting back on topic, we've got here, you're going to hear from, well, you're hearing from me, and we're going to talk from a multinational, an SME, you know, a startup. And I want to just put it into a, a way of thinking about this. If I'm the cruise ship, the, uh, the SME might be the racing yacht. And the, 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 the startup is whitewater rafting. Every one of you might have a preference to that. If you want the acceleration of whitewater rafting, that ride of you know that you're not knowing what's coming next, but you're willing to ride it out. Fabulous startup. SME where it's got more direction of where it wants to go. You know, and it needs to get there quickly because otherwise it's not going to achieve it. SME. The cruise ship knows exactly where it's going. Everybody knows where it's going because it's already been the, the schedule's there. And the rate it's going is steady. Each appeals to different people. One thing is, I can say is, it's the probability of getting wet. You know, and it's, it's your, your, what you really want. So for a multinational, it is secure, caveated on your personal performance. 
there will be well-defined career paths and opportunities, once again caveated on your performance. It allows you to specialise, because talking to Yvonne, being able to go in and say that difference between research and research into a large industrial business, it is the same academic research. They're just transferred with the deadlines and sometimes with a budget, so it doesn't have to be working in that calendar year for your money coming in. Um, this is very much Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, if you know uh, about division of labour. You get experts in each of them. If you're big enough to have the bandwidth, you can deliver more in that, that teamwork. You will have great support structures. You'll have clear policies and procedures. We have dress code. I don't have to wear the tie. I'm just of an age where I feel I'd like to. But it's, there's, there's aspects of all the policies and procedures. And Jeremy has come through all of them. And he can attest to the fact that we seem to have a policy for everything. You might like that. You might like the comfort of that. You are allowed to challenge them. And take it from me, I spend all my time challenging what we do. And you get travel, you know, an upside travel opportunities on multinational depending on which area you go. Each of the areas and opportunities outside the lab, we have those within our business. So it's if if you find something today where you will like you know through the next two days, come and talk to us. There might be opportunities. I don't have a badge, that's not because I've I've walked in off the street, I don't but I am will and I am approachable. Am I and am I on anything like on time? Any questions? Pardon? I'm always doing <laughs> Hello. Uh, I've got a question about um, ideas and delivery. Yes. At the industrial level. Because generating ideas can be quite fast, but the delivery of them can be very long. How are they interpreted, determined? Are they, it is understood. Right. The critical thing of Having an idea, you have to, in the first stage, you have to say, understand, if you can identify how you will generate value from that. So you've taken, you've taken a step back, you look at the, rele the relevance of it to your business, whether it's strategy, and if you understand where it's going. You, and you have to work on your delivery of painting the picture of what it could be in the future. And the, the better you are at painting that picture and the clarity and all of that, and understanding the research of where the competitors may be or how disruptive it could be to your existing technologies or thing, if you can have that slightly wider view and you can share that, then you'll have the people talk to us, you'll get the groups in there. Now, Jeremy behind you will be able to give you a really good thing because he does this daily. I spend my time, it says mine's project development director. I be for me, I have a project in IB. And this is a long term project to take it our business, take it by the scruff of the neck, and drag it to see the value in IB and commit to it. We, we generate a lot in skincare actives, in niche areas, where it has a much wider appeal to our, our business. And that's my job to share internally. But, that's one of many projects I run. I work as an internal consultant, picking up stones and saying, ooh, we could do better here. And all of that is taking that idea of where you can do something better and being able to paint the picture so people get where you're coming from. And that is the biggest part. The delivery side of it, then it falls into a machine. Once your projects are getting, yeah, we're going to do this, it becomes quite well structured or how you're going to put it into a project plan, how you're going to resource it. And then you've got other people that will take that on. Any more?
and we are applying for our jobs in the industry, as we have the title of PhD, uh, is there a possibility to grow in the career faster than a person with undergrad? Or you just apply, for example, uh, in positions, uh, let's say, more specialized, like analyst level one, two, three, you know what I mean? Okay. Um, if I'm going to be blunt, uh, your qualifications, once you're employed, have no value. Once um, we look at you as an individual, we look at how you how you adapt to those. So this is the same way. So uh, it, it, I would be a hypocrite if I wasn't looking at people at at 18 into the apprenticeships and seeing those people that haven't gone through all of it and said, right, we can add the trend. Like Simon said, we can put the, the bits in of, of the knowledge gaps. How you take your learning and knowledge and how you apply that and not taking and export that value to the business and linking those two will demonstrate your worth. But, sorry, it might be that it, it, it gets you into the interview and it might be the deciding factor between two characters, you know, or two characters in to choose two plans. As soon as you're in, uh, one person once said to me, and I was, uh, it was an internal, and because I don't have a PhD, and I'm a chemist. God, I am not qualified to send it. Um, but a young lady came, and I was interviewed. She said, "Would you feel comfortable that?" I have a PhD and you don't. She didn't really understand the soft skills and valuing people. Comes back to the choice about moving from academia or later. If you are somebody's making and wanting to do that change, we'll afford you the opportunity to do it because you made it and wanted to. Why am I bothering being here? Because you guys have all applied to come into this You've all thought about roles beyond the laboratory that it might be an option for us. So you are exactly the people that I want to talk to. Sorry. I was just wondering if you had uh, much process for examining external innovation and, and how the process for bringing that in. Completely. So we have, um, depends on different levels. So we have uh, aspects of uh, an, a general m and corporate development. So uh, where it's an acquisition. We also have what's our uh, technology innovation group. Uh, so we have a global scouting network where we're identifying technologies like fractionation technologies you know, that might be employed across ours. So we have groups there where we'll have discuss and we're up to licensing, you know, purchasing, utilization. And that group comes in. So that's a very, very active Maybe one final question. Once you're within the company, how difficult it is to change your specialization and to change the well-defined path? It's absolutely easy. All you do is apply for a role and tell people why. Um, the hardest thing, and if I'm going to be brutally honest, is if you are so goddamn valuable in that role <laughs> because you do a good survey, then it's very, very, very hard for a business to go there. But you know what becomes even harder? You have to tell you how valuable you are. And then you have this negotiation power that says, now give me more money because I'm not valuable. So it's a cat and mouse game. And that. All I would say is look for something that you enjoy. And if you're not enjoying it, move to something and try it because you're a long time and any choices that you make. I made a mistake, I chose chemistry. <laughs> no, I, all, all joke aside, now, I, if I do biochemistry, microbiology, aspects are with crossword management science, and then um, I'm on the money. Okay. So if Will worked for a cruise ship, I worked for an oil tanker, basically a very large chemical company. 
Um, why does it not surprise me that you are a cruise ship lover? Nice and fancy and lovely. Um, so, it's better to be within the industrial biotechnology community. We all know each other as well, so it's great to introduce someone else who's also an industrial biotechnology leadership forum member. So, um, Edward Green's going to talk to you about the um, opportunities for working in a small and medium sized company. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the medium-sized company. I, I, I operate very much at the, the white uh, water rafting scale, and um, I have done for probably for the best part of 15 years. So I don't know whether that says actually I've not been very successful, or I'm just a glutton for, for, for punishment. Um, I thought what I'd do really is... Oh, oh, sorry. Is, is, is talk a little bit about my experience with two companies that I founded. Um, I'm going to speak tomorrow about starting your own business. So today I won't focus so much on, on startup, but more about what the companies do, um, what sort of people you employ, and how you might fit into those organisations as they grow from effectively standing start. Um, my experience is, um, I, I tend to call myself a microbiologist, and my first degree was, was in microbiology at the University of Nottingham. I did a PhD in biochemical engineering at UMIST, um, or it was UMIST at that time, it's now moved to the University of Manchester. Um, I did a classic, uh, I guess, uh, route in terms of going overseas to do a postdoc in, uh, in the US at Rice University in Houston, and that was largely to carry on my, um, my PhD interests. Um, and then I came back from the US, I went to Sweden for another two year spell, working partly with the university but partly with industry, and then back to the UK uh, and into the, uh, the whitewater rafting stage of my career. First with a, a, a small startup called Agrol, um, based in Guildford, where I spent five years. I left there and then started my own company, Green Biologics, in um, 2004. Um, and then more recently, I've, I've started a new company, Chain Bartek, in, in 2014. Um, and my career really is in three stages. I think first is that, that, that academic stage um, where I've done, done a PhD in a very specific subject. This is working with Clostridia bacteria. And my whole career to date has been based on the use of Clostridia as a, as a, a fermentation host. Um, the second one is around getting SME experience. So after coming back from Sweden, I went into a small bar tech, spent five years there. It wasn't a particularly successful company, but nevertheless, it gave me a good grounding in, 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 in how to work in a small company, and certainly exposure, not just obviously for the science, but the various business and commercial aspects that uh, operate uh, hand in hand. Um, and then through that, I've then gone on to form my own company, and I've now gone and done that again. So, so I, I tend to call myself a microbiologist by training, but a, a serial entrepreneur, having founded uh, two companies based on the, the back of my experience. Um, I won't dwell on this, but my, my, my love in life, uh, aside from other, <laughs> one of the things, is, is, is clostridium bacteria. Um, really versatile microbes. Um, they ferment a broad range of substrates from a very versatile biochemistry, produce a wide range of fermentation products, and therefore they play a pivotal role in industrial biotech, primarily for, for, for renewable chemicals. Um, but the other interesting link with Clostridia is that they're, they're the most prevalent class of bacteria found in your gut, and play uh, an important role in, in maintenance of gut health. And I'll go on to explain how, we've, how we look to exploit the properties and our expertise in Clostridia to d deliver, uh, well, develop and deliver therapeutics. Um, so in terms of my first company, Green Biologics, um, this really is a, a renewable chemical business. I founded this in, from scratch in 2004 um, and gone through quite a few, I guess, development stages along, over the past 10 to 15 years. Um, the company was really based around my, my expertise working with Clostridia. Um, and we used a very simple concept, which was, you know, can we use our skills or my skills um, working with Clostridia, both in terms of engineering the microbe to improve its performance, but also skills in fermentation, and how can we improve the fermentation performance through a combination of both 
strain engineering, but also process development to get a more efficient uh, and cost-effective fermentation process. So the, the company um, started in, um, in, in, um, in Oxford. We, um, we rented porter cabins in a, an incubator space. Um, and then gradually moved from there onto, onto Milton Park, um, built some lab facilities. Um, and along, the, along, along that route, um, developed our, our, our technology, and that was protected through um, patent filing, um, the, the development of trade, the maintenance of trade secrets, for example. And, 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 and really we developed, a, a, I guess, a portfolio of technology around the microbial strain and fermentation process. Um, the company um, expanded through, through acquisition primarily, so we saw an opportunity in, in the US to, to buy a, a, um, a, a US company that had um, large-scale fermentation facilities and people who were expert in, in manufacture of biofuels. So we made the acquisition of that company in, in quite a creative deal um, that gave us access to scale facilities, but also, like I said, um, access to these uh, these people who, who had worked in large scale manufacture, and that's something for an SME we just didn't have that exposure or experience within the company. So we bought a US company. Um, we, we 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 piloted and demonstrated our, our technology at scale in the US, and then later on we moved on and, and, and built. Sorry, we, we developed a commercial uh, fermentation facility in, in, in the US. Um, some of the interesting things along that journey is, is that we, 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 we trialled our technology in China. We worked with several Chinese partners who had already built large-scale fermentation plants. And we introduced our technology onto them, those fermentation plants. Again, a massive step up from, from a small company in, in, in Oxfordshire going in onto a, a large-scale commercial fermentation plant in, in, in China. But nevertheless, that's what we did. And as part of doing that, we obviously learned a lot around scale and, and robustness. But also, we were able to um, produce product. Um, we acquired that product, we shipped it back to North America, and we actually used that product to, to service um, uh, to service customers. Um, so we were trading butanol um, as a chemical in North America through through this production route. And along that journey, we've raised a lot of money. The, the business is very capital intensive because of the need to buy so, or, or develop scale facilities. So effectively what you're doing is investing in large stainless steel tanks that get progressively bigger as your fermentation technology gets closer to a, a commercial endpoint. But it's very expensive. Um, so we've raised a lot of investment, a lot of grant funding along the way that's primarily helped to support the research um, um, base in the UK. Um, and built a team of, of around about 120 people. Um, 30 or 40 of those are based in, in, in the in, in with the remainder now based in, in the US. So that's sort of the story of Green Biologics. Um, and this really is the, is, is the output, um, which is a commercial um, fermentation facility uh, in, in, in Minnesota. Um, it, it, it was a corn, a, a corn fermentation plant. Sorry, corn ethanol fermentation plant. So what it is, is, is for fermenting corn starch with yeast to make ethanol. And uh, we purchased this plant in, um, in 2014, and then we converted this use, use to, 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 to uh, accommodate our technology, which allows it then to convert corn starch into biobutanol and also bioacetone, using clostridium as the, as, the, as the fermentation vehicle. And this is now operational in, in, in the US. Um, so just switching gears now, so I, I sort of, um, I was quite drained after this, this process of taking fermentation technology through a scale-up route into, into commercial facility, primarily because of the, the, the requirement for, for capital to, to fund this process. And um, about four or five years ago, I sort of stepped back and thought, well, what else can I do with Australia? And how else can we position this, this, this bacterium uh, into, into a, an application or market that perhaps is less capital intensive. And this obviously means focusing on things high value products. Um, and when you look at this slide, it's a very crude attempt to show that on the bottom left there is that you can use the, 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 the fermentation process to produce solvents. They typically sell for somewhere between one to two dollars a kilo. 
not very expensive, um, the, the, the margin on, on those products is very small, and you're very um, susceptible to any changes in commodity price, like the feedstock pricing coming in, or indeed the price at which you can sell your product, which is linked very much to, to oil pricing. Um, so I wanted to get away from that model, and as you, you sort of go this chain, what you can see is that Clostridia are, are very versatile microbes, they produce a, a wide variety of different chemical products that, that, that feed into a high value chemical um, uh, markets, more niche applications, but you can get a, a high value for, for, for the chemical product. They also produce a wide range of, of, of bioactives, peptides, enzymes, that again can go into uh, um, uh, uh, health and beauty products, nutritional products, etc., or indeed pharmaceutical products. Um, one of my interests is, is microbiome and the use of clostridium as, as a microbiome therapeutic, and I'll talk about that next. Um, and then at the sort of the far end of the scale, um, I think everyone knows about Botox, um, the clostridium botulinum toxin. Um, that perhaps is one of the best examples of, of, of a, a biotech product from clostridium. Um, in the marketplace today, and, and, and one that's been commercially very, very successful. And then beyond that, there's the, the, there's cancer treatments, for example, coming out of the University of Nottingham, where they use spore-based clostridium to deliver prodrugs into into tumours. But the, the the unifying thing here is that all these the, these potential products and applications are all, all based on the use of clostridium. Um, so in terms of chain, the, the ambition with this company is to build a, a, a world-class microbiome company. Um, I think perhaps most people probably have seen, more or less on a, on a daily or weekly basis, um, interest in the microbiome, some association, association between the microbiome, um, health and, also, uh, and linkage through to various diseases. Um, basically, the, the, the composition, both in terms of um, bacterial number, for example, and diversity has a profound effect on, on health. And when you lose those, those microbiota, for example, through, through a course of antibiotics, then that typically then leads to a, a, a variety of different diseases, um, including localised diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease, osteoarthritis, colitis, um, uh, Crohn's disease, uh, but also systemic diseases. And, and there's linkages all the way through to things like uh, neurological disorders, autism, um, dementia, etc. So our goal really is to think about how can we manipulate the population of clostridium in the gut, um, both in terms of, 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 of increasing the number there, but also in terms of what they produce. And can we start to think about clostridium as a, a delivery vehicle to both produce and deliver therapeutics into the gut, and therefore have an impact on, on, on some of these um, chronic, um, quite debilitating diseases, particularly around inflammation. Um, so CHAIN was founded about, well, just over three years ago now. We've raised about just short of two million through, through a mix of, of grant funding and, uh, and investment. Um, we have a, a, an office in Marlow, which is where I'm based, and our technical team is based at the University of Nottingham. Um, and what we've done is quite a creative way to start the company is, is, is we've embedded our guys into the university. And that's great because we can capitalise on the infrastructure, the, um, the labs, um, and also we can tap into uh, you know, world leading experts in Clostridia through the university uh, and university collaboration. So, um, again, the company is a microbiology company, and we focus on synthetic biology. Um, fermentation with clostridia and it's all um, de designed or the technology is all designed to, to effectively um, build a platform technology using clostridium that can both produce and deliver therapeutics to the gut. Um, just going back now, sorry. <coughs> it's very faint that one but you can bet the the, the technology works really, it's, it's based on two characteristics. The first is the, the bugs are anaerobic, which means they will grow in their anaerobic conditions. They're also spore forms. And we use that feature to produce the, the spore, sorry, to produce the, the, the product. And, and the spore feature then allows it to, to transmit or transfer through the stomach without getting broken down. So we make spores as, as a fermentation product. They're formulated into a tablet. The tablets are ingested. 
the spores go through the stomach. Um, they they traverse through the colon, sorry, through the, 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 the GI tract into the colon until they reach anaerobic conditions. At that point, the, the, the spores germinate, the cells grow, they produce the bioactive of, of interest, and then they continue to, to pass through the, uh, the colon and uh, are excreted. And the, the key technology piece here is that we use, use our engineering skills to um, uh, get the microbes to produce a specific therapeutic payload. And that's quite versatile. We can target metabolites, we can target peptides, we can look at enzymes, or we've now got a new project looking at, uh, at, at vaccines. So I'll skip that next slide. Um, so I guess the reason I'm here is, 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 is why I work for an SME. Uh, and I think you've, 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 you've sort of seen some of the, 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 I guess, the benefits for working for, for a bigger company, a multinational. Um, I think some of the main concerns around um, working for an SME or indeed a startup really is around job security. I think around 90% of, 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 of startup biotechs fail within the first three years of their life. So, so the odds are stacked against you. Um, um, the good thing is, and I think is, is, is the, well, about the top point is that you have, coming to an SME or a startup at an early stage, is that you have a, a huge um, um, opportunity to, 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 to affect the outcome of that company. You, you, you will play a major role uh, and potentially de-risk the, uh, the chances of that company failing. So, so you are an integral part of the, uh, of the success of the company. Um, there's, um, I, th I think, one of the, the, the cons potentially is around salary. It's very difficult for startups and SMEs to match um, large companies, particularly in the pharmaceutical sector. And so we need to be quite creative about how we attract um, the best people. Um, I mean, one of the mechanisms we use is, is share options, which, which uh, is a very um, tax efficient mechanism, um, uh, hopefully to motivate uh, employees but obviously you'll only get a return on that, uh, on those share options if the company gets to some sort of successful endpoint, either through a trade sale or a, a stock market flotation, or, or there's some mechanism whereby you can sell those shares, and ultimately that's very much linked to the success of the company. Um, I won't go through these step by step, but what I did, I went, I went and asked a couple of people in, in my company and said, well, what are, what are the benefits of working for a for, 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 for chain? And, and these more or less mirror the, 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 the table in the previous slide. So just, just working through these, um, they seem to enjoy the responsibility, this, this, this point of where every, every person is an integral, integral part of the company and therefore makes a, a, a real difference, a real, you know, a real contribution to the success of the business. Um, there's an opportunity around skill development that we, we typically don't have very formal training programs, which again is, could, could be viewed as a, as a con. Um, but what we do have is the opportunity to get into other parts of the business, not just your very specific technical fields. So for example, you can get involved in, in grant writing, you can get involved in patent applications, you get exposure to customers, you may support uh, a business development manager, uh, you may get exposure to investors coming to the company where you provide some technical um, uh, information. Um, and um, so, so, so I think in, in terms of getting, you know, getting that exposure and, and the opportunity to develop skills outside your very specific technical area, I think is, is a big plus point. Um, some of the other things here is that, that um, again, it's, it's, it's um, I think it's more or less the same things here that, that are coming out. Uh, your voice can be heard. I think you have direct channels of communication, not just obviously through your, your, your line manager, but all the way through to the chief executive and indeed the board. You know, if you've only got like half a dozen people in the company, then you're going to know everyone involved in that company, including the board and potentially the, the investors in the company. And it's very accessible. You know, it's, it's, it's not like you need to go through tiers of people to... to, to to, to, to get a point across. Um, and, and then I think one of the final points there is that it's a great team environment. Um, because it's, everyone is um, it's a small team, everyone knows each other. Um, 
it's a great environment to work in, providing, and I guess I say provide, providing you actually, you, you, you are a team player. Um, it's, it's, it's one team, everyone's working together for, for essentially the same, the, the same, same purpose. And, then, uh, and, and more or less everyone will interact on a, on, on a daily basis. So those are the, some, of the, some of the things you can read these that, uh, that my staff said uh, around the benefits of working for an SME. <coughs> in terms of, of roles and what I've seen with both my companies is um, we tend to bring people in in a very specific technical role. We, we generally always look at people that could come in and bring some complementary skills to the ones we've got. Um, so if we've got a bunch of electrobiologists, we don't necessarily want to bring in more electrobiologists. We want to bring people in, for, for example, that may have bioinformatics skills or analytical skills. Or in the case of chain now, we're looking for, for an immunologist, which is something we don't have. So we're always looking to try and find complementary skills. Um, and what I've seen with people that, that I've, I've recruited in the past is that they've typically then gone on to um, take on more responsibility through either project management or program management. Um, they may become team managers, office managers, um, and take on more, more non-specific technical roles. So they may oversee, for example, an electrobiologist may oversee a fermentation group, or they may get involved in some sort of um, business support. Uh, and then looking down the list, um, what I've seen people transfer into, certainly with Green Biologics as a company called Bigger, is that we, we, we one of the guys turned into a, to, into a grant writer. That was their, 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 their sole job, was writing grant applications. We also employ someone who is a, effectively just, just, just writes patents and uses the IP, the patent portfolio. So those are two, as you get bigger, those are two, uh, two jobs that effectively end up as being full-time roles. Um, we have people involved in promotional activities, the website, social media, presentations. Um, and then, like I said before, support to the commercial operations and also, um, ultimately, a management role. So there's no reason why you couldn't progress, also on the technical side, all the way through into, into the chief technical officer of the company or indeed the chief executive. Um, so the great thing when you start coming from scratch is that you can put an organogram together and then you can start filling in boxes. And if you start the company, you, you can obviously put yourself in as the chief executive or managing director of the company one. Well, that's always quite a nice place to start. Um, so this is really how, how I built chain over the last sort of two to three years. Um, I was fortunate I had a co-founder, Baz Lomar, uh, when we started. Um, and from the get-go, I, I employed two people. One, one guy works on business development, so I was, right from the start, I was looking at, at trying to understand what the, the customer wants, what the commercial need is, and how we could fit or tell our technology for to meet that, that, that demand. And then the second person uh, was someone to look after the, uh, the bookkeeping, the accounts, payroll, finances, uh, which you need to understand, but obviously it's, it's a massive drain in terms of time. Um, so then we went out and we got some seed funding, that brought us some board members, it allowed us to recruit some technical people, that, as I mentioned earlier, they're based at the University of Nottingham. Um, we're missing one of our board members there, I think. Oh, he's half there. Um, we, we raised a little bit more money, seed funding, and we've got another board member as part of that, because typically as you raise an investment, then larger investors will, will look for a board seat. So that's why you can see that the, the, the board is growing perhaps faster than the, uh, the technical team. Um, but with a bit more money, you can recruit a few more people. Um, so the technical team, team has expanded. So we've gone out from what we call our platform development, which is around developing the technology, um, to look at lab quality, sorry, quality and the lab manager. And then we've been quite creative in that we've now recruited quite a few um, consultants in the business that provide an, in, an interim solution to bring in those complementary skills around um, manufacture, around regulatory, around, uh, around clinical um, uh, experience. And over time, we'll, we'll internalise those positions. And then we've built up a bunch of academic collaborators, both at the University of Nottingham, but also at three big universities in, in the UK. So that's kind of where we are with the chain and how that's evolving. Uh, and we just now completed a new funding round and that will now allow, allow me to go back and, and fill one or two more gaps on this uh, organogram.
So, um, in summary, I, I, I think for me, when I when I see CVs, I think for for me, I'm always looking for um, um, that one in a hundred person that can come in, make a real difference, but also someone that's that, that, that's going to bring us something different to what we already have. Um, and the difficult thing, I think, from the applicant side is actually understanding what what those you know, what those needs are. I think from from our side, and and hopefully they're in the job spec. But you really need to address, I think, the the, the specific requirements for the company. Um, I think I, I, I put something there about do your due diligence on the company. I think particularly if you get a job offer from a startup or SME, you should go back and ask about the thing. Ask about the sustainability of the business over the next 12, 24 months. Um, don't just accept a job in a company that may go bust in three months. I think you, you, need, you need to do checks and balances, I think, before you start or, or agree to join the company. Um, I think what's important, if you do decide to go down that route, um, then you really need to buy in very early to, to, to the, the vision, uh, and this is primarily around the founder's vision, um, what he's trying to achieve, and also um, uh, yeah, their values, um, because effectively those values then transcend through the entire company, and as you bring people in, they, 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 they conform to those sets of, uh, of values. Um, you need to be self-motivated from the start, um, and, and retain that flexibility. Things will change, and they do chop and change quite quickly. Um, and the final point there, it's a great experience, particularly if you want to go on and then start your own company. So if you want to spend three years or five years in a, in a startup, or, and then have entrepreneurial aspirations, then that's a great sort of <coughs> grounding, I think, in trying to understand how these, how these companies operate, primarily from, you know, certainly from a financial uh, point of view. So the, the bottom there really is that, um, it's a risky option. Um, it's, it is, it is white water rafting, but it is rewarding. It's, it's, it's something I've done, like I said, as a career for the best part of 15 years. Um, you can make a difference. You can make significant value, and ultimately, you know, you can p play a, a major role in terms of de-risking that business. And I wish I'm there. Thank you. Time, but we've got one question. But hopefully, oh, I mean, all our speakers around all day and saying mm -hmm. this evening, right? So, but maybe one fairly quick question. Sorry, lady. Yeah. So, in the book that you described in your company, you said that you can start with a specific technical role and then go up to project management and so on. Can you, so, most of the people enter from that group? Can you start project manager management? If so, what are the qualifications you can do? You can do. I think for for small companies, it's quite a luxury to bring in a project manager. As as uh, so, what we tend to do is is promote people that have um, have come in to, to fulfil a specific technical function, and then are looking to, to gain more more responsibility. Um, to take on a project management role. Um, thanks again. Um, so, yeah, we've just heard it's very rewarding and obviously has had a huge amount of success in his career in terms of building up companies, but not, not about the challenges. So, moving on to a um, Another small company has been out from Oxford University. So Matt Hodges is going to talk to us about his experience as well. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I suppose, continuing the analogy of uh, cruise ship versus a raft, uh, we're very much in the, in the rapids at the moment. But we can see the a lot front, and we're just cautious that we've got the paddle on our hands, and it's hopefully not a waterfall coming up rather than open water. So that's where Oxford Biotrans is at the moment. As just been introduced. Um, we're a startup spun out of the University of Oxford in the end, end of 2015 now. So we've been going for about four, nearly five years, and we're 14 people. So we've really grown from, from working at home, really, uh, to eventually getting some lab space using CROs or contract manufacturers to do a lot of that legwork to de risk the business. And then now, yeah, building in a team, getting our own labs, 
and sort of seeing that journey. So hopefully I'll try and uh, explain some of the things that we look for in people and also what you could be looking for when you're looking at companies like ours uh, to apply for because obviously we're always hiring, so uh, <laughs> put the plug in early. Uh, and one thing, I've sort of flipped it around a little bit. Rather than talk about the company, I'm going to talk about the company at the end uh, and talk about people first. But I do think skills, workshop as it, as it were, and those are the things that build our company. As I said, we started working part-time at home, uh, and it's really the people who have brought it to 14, 14 people now. So uh, it's, that's, that's, that's the key element. And getting that team right, I think, is very important. So hearing that you're going to leave Melbourne later, it's great. You know, really put your effort into doing that and getting, getting an understanding. Because it's not just how you work, it's self-reflection on how you can work with other people. Because you're never going to get a result, you're never going to get an innovation into the consumer's hand without working with other people at some, some point. So it's really making sure that you do that in the most effective manner. Uh, so as I said, uh, a little bit of background for myself. Uh, obviously I haven't been in the industry for too long, hopefully you can tell. Uh, but uh, I started off at Oxford, uh, before I started off at Oxford, I transited my undergrad and DPhil at University of Oxford, working on molecular biology and genetics. I was looking at cilia, evolution and cell signaling, if that's of interest to anyone. We'll talk about it later for hours, I'm sure, but I've probably forgotten most of it. Uh, but the key things there, and I think maybe one of the comments earlier about you know, how valuable is a PhD for, uh, for a company, isn't necessarily what you do. I mean, I don't work on Cilia anymore. Uh, I'm nowhere near, no, no one near a, a lab very much anymore, actually, to be honest. Uh, but when you actually think about what you're learning at the moment, or as an early career stage, or even late career, what you've learned, how you've worked with the team, how you've built up a research plan, how you executed that plan, and how you made sure that those results are you know, told to the world through a paper or just through conferences, you know, making sure that you actually have an impact on the basis of your results rather than just keeping it to yourself. And so that's sort of the key sort of hopeful top skills that are really important to be learning always and hopefully continuing to learn them as you go through your career. But quite early on, I was lucky enough to get involved in a few different startups and I've sort of mentioned one of them here, Nitec Solutions, which is sort of looking to move batch processes into continuous flow chemistry. Uh, and I sort of got early, early on very quite involved with the founder of that, and sort of understanding the business and sort of understanding what the strategy could be. And I realised that, you know, as I was doing this, as I was doing my PhD, I realised that I really enjoyed those type of questions rather than maybe the actual being on the bench doing science. And so I sort of thought to myself, if I really want to make an impact and, and move businesses along strategy, strategic pathways and into commercialisation, I needed to learn a bit more skills about how to do that. So I took maybe, some people frown upon it a little bit, uh, you know, in, especially in academic circles, but I took the route at the end of my PhD uh, to go into consulting, uh, general strategy consulting. Uh, and it was always, uh, I must admit, as a, as a defence shield or something, it was always a short term plan for me, sort of a, an MBA style, uh, learn on the job uh, element. But it was really to understand how do big businesses work, how do teams work, uh, what are the key you know, finance bits? You know, we heard it just, just now that finance is very difficult in a small business. Uh, so what do you need to keep on top of? What are the important you know, metrics to measure and, and to understand? And also how to commercialise a product. So you know, lots of very great ideas churned out every day, but getting them into the, into the consumers and seeing what the consumer wants is vital. You, from the first step, before you even write a business plan, you need to understand what that consumer wants and if it has a role and if it has a value over what else is in there. And more importantly, will consumer pay for what you think that value is? Because that's a big problem with IB at the moment. You know, if you walk around, people love sustainability. Uh, it's very important to be environmentally impactful and, and, and to you know, recycle. And these are all big hit, hot topics all over the news at the moment. But if you put two bottles in front of people and say this one costs 50p and this one costs 5p, most people will buy the 5p bottle. And that's a fact, you know, you, you, can say, you can say Coca-Cola should be doing more work on making sure their bottles are fully recyclable, and they are doing biobased plastics, but it's been a big, big struggle in the industry to get them to buy them at a price which is a little bit more above than a fetch chemical source. And that's sort of where we're at at the moment, but understanding and how to, come, how to really get your message across to the consumer so that they actually perceive the value as well, and you know, David Attenborough's show on plastics in the water, has really done a massive change on that, because suddenly people, it's clicked, and they said, actually, I might pay a little bit more if it's clean. And that's you know, changing things. So, but it's, it's very important when you're thinking about any business that you don't ignore cost. At the end of the day, cost value is probably the biggest evil whether, whether you'll be successful or not. You could have the most amazing product in the world, but if it's 20% more expensive than the one next to it, not many people will buy it. 
Uh, but anyway, so I did uh, consulting for quite a few years, uh, and then towards the end of that once, I thought I was like, sort of built up quite a good network in, in IB and other, other areas, life sciences. I was sort of softly feeling for opportunities to move it back into a sort of startup situation. I had a conversation that probably lasted about 18 months while Oxford Biotrans was getting its seed funding together, and then moved in once Oxford Biotrans had some funding uh, to sort of bring the business up with, uh, with our CEO, Jason King. Uh, so that's kind of the background to me. Uh, so now I want to sort of use maybe what I've learned, and it's probably wrong, and it's full of cliches, but hopefully can be useful for you, uh, into sort of what, what I look for, hopefully in myself, and to build on, but also when I'm trying to bring some hires in. And uh, so the employee, you know, hopefully one of you, or many of you, depending how big we get, uh, we've hired uh, quite a few people now, as I said, 14, <coughs> and they've all been relatively either sort of, well actually, uh, actually spanning a, quite a broader way now, but a lot of them are graduates or early stage career people. Others have come in being brought in from you know, a bit more industrial experience, uh, to sort of uh, to flesh out, as it were, the experience body and make sure that it seems fully functioning. Uh, and they've got, you know, with or without advanced degrees. And, and that's one thing that's sort of key to it. It's not really, you know, as, as mentioned, it's getting the interview, maybe your CV and degree, and, and degree is very helpful there on the career progression so far. But it's really about people and how willing, you know, they are to hit the ground running. And it's, it's a big cliche to say that. But that's very important in a startup. Maybe in a cruise ship, you can join in and sort of slowly build up your career, go on training courses to learn different sets. But in a, in a small startup, you're, you are really sort of, it's hoped at least, that you're, you're coming to do maybe a specific job or a specific area, but very quickly you'll move on to do lots of other things that you didn't really have any idea to do. You might love even more, so that's where your career will go off in, in the course uh, of your life. So it's really the making sure that you're, you're keen and you get that buy-in, as we sort of stated by Ed there. You, you, you're joining for the right reasons and willing to basically do what you need to do to get to get the work done and to get the company to be successful, to make that, you know, to, be able to, to be the deal breaker really in, in, in the company. And a PhD can be very helpful for that because it can give you a lot of, you know, you've been four more years as it were of training, uh, which, which has a lot of value in it, uh, but it's not necessarily the sort of the be or an end or, it's more about the attitude I would say. Uh, one thing I would say, maybe a little bit has to, um, a couple of questions from the Group. If you've got a PhD, I mean, I think it is four years experience, so it's not necessarily better than four years in industry, but it's maybe maybe more valuable to you, to most companies than a grad, graduate uh, as, as such. And likewise, a school leaver can be it's it's more time in time in job as it were rather than the actual qualification or the degree. So it's, there is a bit more value there, but it's it maybe not skyrocketing skyrocketing straight away. Uh, the role, as I said. Uh, a stolen graphic, but it's, it's you wear very many hats, uh, and that's that's key. Really, you're sort of juggling lots of different things. You know, I come in on an average day, and I'll do a little bit of R and D in terms of our look at results, or I'll plan out some experiments with people. I walk around the labs area and sort of see if there's any problems. You know, as, as mentioned, it's a lot easier to see if there's a problem going along with a piece of equipment or experiment when you're actually by the bench rather than uh, just sitting on a computer or email. But then I'll do lots of computer and email things as well, you know, on the commercial side. I'll, I'll maybe speak to a potential customer, I'll speak to a, a we do flavour and fragrances, so I'll speak to like a, what's called a nose, who's sort of like a, someone with an incredible fa old factory senses, but they build fragrances and flavours, and so I'll speak to them and try and understand that, well, it's a GC 95% purity, why isn't it smelling quite like what you want to, and that 5% impurity is the important thing. So I understand that type of thing. And then, uh, yeah, and then, I'll, and then I'll do more, you know, maybe some finances or something, which may be boring, but payroll, you know, people want to get paid, so it's important to do. So a lot of different hats, a lot of different flexibility, and equally, if you come in and work purely on the technical side, you know, a lot of what we do is biology, but a lot of it is chemistry, a lot of biochemistry, engineering, understanding how something can go from a few mils to cubic meters is very important, and sort of designing your experiments with that in mind, because we, we do want to be fleeced for it, uh, is very key. So yeah, lots of different roles and hopefully fun and enjoying doing those different roles, challenging. You know, I've always been told whenever I was getting career advice, and I'd always ask people about career advice, uh, to sort of look for jobs where you're comfortable with about you know 60% of it and 40% of it and be like, oh God. Uh, and maybe it starts up to a little bit more 50-50, uh, but hopefully you enjoy that oh God moment and quickly uh, learn, learn a bit more. Uh, but there's always going to be another 50% you don't know, if that makes sense. Uh, you have a lot of visibility, so 
that's maybe one thing which is some people love, some people don't love. But again, you're not going to be reporting to a line manager. You're probably going to be reporting to the CEO. You know, Jason in our company knows what everyone is doing all the time because there's 14 of us and we're all in one, you know, one, one office and lab area. So people know what you're doing. Uh, likewise, you can't just hide behind sort of a wall uh, if you're not performing. But I think the, the, the key element there is that failure isn't bad. You know, if, if you think maybe in your PhDs or early career, you know, you're working on a grant proposal or you're working on a, on a project which has been granted and your results just aren't coming out anywhere near what you expected or what you wanted. Actually, in a startup, that's quite good. I mean, we don't mind failing quite quickly. We're not quite maybe uh, IT level of you know, build and break very quickly. But you know, we, we, we want to know if something's not going to work or not take it through to plan or pilot scale. So failure is important. Failure is really actually great to shout about. So you know, the degree of success in failure, I suppose. Um, and yeah, again, to build on sort of a, a common raft versus cruise ship, there isn't as much time for formal training. I mean, I think we, we do try, and actually the NIBs are fantastic sources for that little plug there, for continued funding, uh, <laughs> that they can you know, provide money to send people on courses, so where necessary, to learn a piece of equipment or analytical skill set. We do try and do that, and we try and support that, but a lot of it is on the job, either from you know, actually learning from academics, you know, like yourselves, do a collaboration or something and, and learn from them, or learning from your peers. And it's you know, teamwork and understanding what everyone else is bringing so that you can help them out on an experiment and maybe do the experiment by yourself next time. So yeah, it's, it's learning on the job. Uh, and that really, that learning on the job comes into the team. You know, it's a small number of people. Uh, it needs to be very collaborative. Uh, there's not a lot of room uh, for people who want to try and do it alone in a startup. You can, you can pretend you can cure everything yourself, but you're not going to be able to. You need to work with other people. And, and unlike maybe in some situations where you know, a company has a luxury to have maybe have two competing teams working on the same product, which does happen a lot, uh, we don't do that. You know, everyone's working on the first product or the second product in the pipeline. And we need everyone to be able to you know, be, speak up and share their good ideas as quickly as possible. So the, the most relative person who can do that chore, as it were, or task, does it rather than someone saying, well, I'm going to keep that back and then come up with the next presentation with a great result that everyone's going to clap me for. It doesn't work like that. As soon as you think of something, speak to the person who you think is most relevant to it, or speak to everyone, uh, and, and get it done, and get it started. And that's, a, that's the other thing. Veterans are, are mentors, so um, you, everyone can be a veteran. It doesn't need, you know, it's just someone who's got experience in that field. It doesn't mean they've got 28 years experience or one year experience. It's, it's the fact that they've done it uh, and they understand the, the concept and so therefore they can teach you. And that's a good thing, because you can learn from them and then hopefully teach them something back and both of you are better. So yeah, so it's building some of hearts, really. Uh, and that builds to the organisation as such. I mean, we're very, and um, you probably hear about this, a lot, we're a flat organisation. You know, there is hierarchy in that there's, there's Jason, the boss, <laughs> but then there's pretty much everyone else. Uh, and that's great, because as I said, the right person can do the right task and you can learn from each other very quickly. But it also means that we have a business plan and we have sort of a product that we know we need to bring to our customers. Uh, but how we get there wasn't necessarily known you know, four and a half years ago. It's very different from what we wrote down four and a half years ago to what we do now. And it'll be incredibly different probably in a year's time, never mind four and a half years. So the great thing about IB is it's moving rapidly, but because it's moving rapidly, most plans sort of fall apart pretty quickly. So at times it can feel like Working at a startup is incredibly disorganised. You can sort of think to yourself, what am I, what am I going to do today, or what am I even going to be working on next week? Uh, and so that's one thing I stress: is if you enjoy that type of sort of change or, or flux, as it were, at fast pace, that's that's great. But if you really love to have one product project that you can work on in isolation for a year, maybe it's not the best thing. It could be in certain situations, but maybe not all situations, uh, because as, as I said, it. So there is a lot of failure because we're trying new things and we're trying to sort of create a different system or a different process, but and that can be very inefficient. But hopefully, the, as long as you're communicating why things fail and, and learning from them, it, in the end, you get to a good position. So, yeah, again, good communication and team working skills are, are really paramount in any organization, but in a small one, especially. Uh, and that sort of links that, that sort of moving relatively quickly. Uh, links very well in, into the business. Um, when you're with a startup, you know, as, as I mentioned, you're kind of continuously going through 
uh, funding related really to, to pay for the next stage of the business. And that's important because nobody's going to give you all the money at, at the first point to get the job done because that would be very risky because it's 90% of the pay over three years. So what they do, uh, finance, finance is they give you little bits of money, probably a little bit less than you need to get you to the next stage. And so it's very important to plan those stages very sensibly so that you are realistic in what's, what the next gate is, but understand that to get to the gate after, you will need to raise more money. So that's kind of the, the underground churn which has always occurred. And maybe if you go into a technical role at a startup, you won't necessarily view that as an activity, but you'll know it's going on, especially if the, if the company's open, and that's important. Uh, because it does lead to everyone feeling secure as well, that they know that there's activities going on and that the fact that we need to raise money isn't necessarily a bad thing, it's generally a good thing. Uh, but it does mean that you need to be pragmatic, you need to get jobs done uh, when, when it's expected. So over, over sort of deliver and under promise, I think that's the key thing. If you're given a task and you said, yes, I can definitely do that, and you've talked about how to do it, and then in a month's time, someone says, oh, sorry, I haven't been keeping up with you, but is that task done? And you say, oh, no, I haven't even started. I've been working on this thing. That's not good. <laughs> it needs to be communicated that you haven't started early on. There might be a very good reason to move on to something else, but it needs, everyone needs to be aware of what's happening so the plans can be made and it can be understood that some deliverable, deliverables are actually fundamental you know, that, that will be needed for the business to continue. Uh, and then finally, sort of on, on this piece, the reward. I think in, in the papers you sort of read about entrepreneurs becoming billionaires, and that's, that's great. Uh, and I think you know, that's where every company wants to get to. But I think realistically, uh, you'll get share options at most startups, and they could be worth something if the company is successful. And until it's successful, they're not worth anything. So your salary is what, what you'll get. And even then, in most cases, you won't become a billionaire because somebody's put money into the business to, to enable it to occur, and they'll get most of the financial reward from that risk. So you'll get you know, a nice amount of money, but it's not, I wouldn't go into any startup really, or even founding your own company, thinking that success in this is going to make you a billionaire. The, the entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs who are billionaires probably done quite a few different uh, spin outs and businesses along the way to get there. So it's really an opportunity, especially you know, at most stages of careers, it's an opportunity to learn. And I think that's invaluable. I mean, in terms of the knowledge you get from, the, from being in a startup, uh, is invaluable. You know, you're going to be doing a lot of different things and you're working with different types of people, but you're also going to be talking to big companies as well all the time. So when you talk about networking and you have a, 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 an impact on, uh, you have a session on networking, uh, you're going to be talking to the guys who may one day buy you in a trade sale or actually buy your products. Uh, so build that network. You know, if your your business goes under, maybe you can get a job with them. Uh, and that's being pragmatic, but it's also meaning that equally, when their M&A team goes to look for buying new technologies, they might come and talk to you first because they realise that it's pretty good. So it's sort of an opportunity to learn one, you know, how to do your particular bit of area that you're interested in to start up on, but also very, you know, very easily move into different areas of the business. And sort of you could start off on a technical team, end up as a CTO if you really love R&D, and you know, that could be a one career path. But equally, you could, you know, end up having being sent on a CFA course a little bit and become CFO because you really love numbers and you didn't know. You know, <laughs> that's the opportunity in the startup. You can, you can move around if you add value to the company and that's, uh, it's very easy to prove that you add value to a company when it's small. <laughs> so, uh, and also the multiplier effect is good. So I think 10% you know, to, to nothing is a lot more than adding 1% you know, to 100. But, so that's kind of uh, the overview of, I don't know, do I have a few more minutes? Or? Oh. Because uh, I was just saying, you know, talk about lots of five months very briefly, sure. if I've got stuff. So, but so using the sort of the team that we built up with some of those principles that hopefully made some sense to you, or at least you saw a little bit of yourself in. Uh, what does Oxidizans do? So very simply, we use enzymes uh, to make chemicals, which is a lot of this IB world. Uh, we use people 50 enzymes uh, to do selective oxidations, and we have a platform of people 50s, which I think are crucially able to do lots of different oxidations, but very selectively. And actually the breakthrough piece, because most enzymes will do most reactions in, in one mill, is that we can control the tighter scalability and actual volume scalability. So we can go from something which is you know, a micromolder to good titers, which are you know, millimolars and molars of substrates, and from 
you know, milled to 100 cubic meters in a, in a, in a vessel. And we have control and linear ability over that. So that's the, the, the key thing and the key promise of enzymes is that they can do lots of different things. They can do it in an aqueous environment, in a non, non high impact chemistry route. Uh, they can relatively do it quickly and you know, low temperature, so it's relatively cheap. But unless you have high productivity for that at a high scale, it's very difficult to get either the product out because you're going to have to do expensive chromatography or actually just to, you know, to make enough of it at a decent cost. So again, it, it does come down to cost and sort of controlling those enzymatic reactions so that you can scale that. But that's what we've been working on. Uh, we've focused on high value compounds initially because uh, we knew that the process was going to be expensive when it started off. And so one of them is a flavor and fragrance compound called uh, Nucatone. And so we're sometimes known as a grapefruit company because you take a little bit of it, it smells like grapefruit. And that's what it's used for. But it's also used in lots of other products. Uh, so it is used in beverages and, and you know, anything on the shelf, which is grapefruit products with Nucatone in it. But it's also used in mushroom flavor, for example, because sensors are weird. Uh, and putting a little bit of a high note in there makes it taste nicer. So, you know, it's very complex how the old organoleptic properties work. Uh, some, somebody in here is probably working on the sectors in the mouth uh, and the nose, uh, but the way compounds interact together is very interesting. And so sometimes a, a compound which by itself is a bit of sweet flavour just has an additive effect or an enhancer of flavour when it's mixed with something else. So we now have, uh, we took, as I said, from Lewitt Wong's lab at the University of Oxford, our academic founder, uh, we took that process uh, using a piece of to make nucatone. Uh, and now we have products in the market, so we have a commercial product which is running and, and you know, bought and sold in the market. Uh, so that's our first product, but I mean, that's the chemistry of it, I wouldn't bother talking about it, but it's, yeah, low cost, because it's sort of a bucket of water with uh, an enzyme and some sugar. Uh, pre premium pricing because it's natural. Uh, you, if you're in, under EU laws, if you go from a natural substrate to a natural product using an enzyme, it's a biological process and it's natural, uh, but it's very sustainable, and that's the key element. Uh, because we can compete on costs and we can compete on sustainability. Uh, so where, where we're at, as I've said, we started towards the end of 2013, uh, spun out uh, with a small seed funding. We did it all at that time without building any labs, because we thought, let's try and prove the concept works first and we use CROs. The UK is fantastic for that. If you're thinking about doing your own business, use places like CPI, etc. There's, there's quite a few lists of them, but they, they, you know, they have all the skills, they have all the equipment, and you can hire them basically. Uh, to do proof of concept work or even bigger work if you want to. Uh, or food film if you've got a lot more money. <laughs> and then uh, we, we sort of proof the technology and off the back of that took it to a reasonable scale and, and that, that made it real and that meant we could go out and raise a significant amount of money, so 2.5 million, uh, to actually build our own labs, bring in more people, so we've got about team to 12 people. Uh, and actually have our size in Milton Park and begin manufacturing scale up. So we're actually going from you know, hundreds of litres to cubic metres to the actual process. Uh, by January 2016, we had the labs, we had the people, we did, we, you know, we, we've been moving quite quickly on that. So we've got our fermentation positioning quite well and the biotransformation as well, uh, which meant that we could actually get uh, product out and sold into the market. And so that meant that in 2017, again on the success gate, uh, we went out and raised more money because we said, look, we've done one process, let's do more of that one process and let's do process two and three. And so we've been developing our pipeline and we're about to raise more money again to sort of accelerate that to get to about 25 people and just be able to push more products out at the same time. Because it's always a race, we have a technology platform and we can make products, but other people will be doing it. So we want to bring out as many products as quickly as possible and lower the cost of production even more. So that's our next route really, sort of rather than being a great company, being the FNF company first, and then being, I don't know, pharmaceuticals or whatever, which, whatever comes next. So, thank you very much for, for listening, and uh, hopefully uh, that brought some questions. Yeah, so, we, so the seed funding, uh, I think seed funding needs to have sort of a good sort of, if you're thinking 
proof of concept, you know, it's sort of this idea will work and we have a business plan behind it at millilitre scale really in, a, in an IB system uh, and you'll get some money behind it. Depends, depending on how sort of good the financial system is at the time, depends on how much money we raise. We started off in actually quite a bad time to raise money <laughs> in some respects, uh, so our seed was relatively small, which meant that we had to, you know, we didn't build our lab straight away. What we did was we, we took a pragmatic approach and said, look, we want to get our proof of concept to, you know, litre scale, as it were, running in a bioreactor so that we're confident that it will probably work before we raise serious money. Um, and so that meant we sort of, yeah, worked part-time and we worked with organisations who have the equipment to get it done. But I think de-risking things is, is very important and understanding at stage steps of what success means. Don't try and get product into the hands of the consumer in a year because unless you, I think, lucky and also incredible, it probably won't happen. To think what do we need to get to convince people that the idea is sound and the business plan has evolved but it's better and that's another stage to raise money so it's sort of lots of little steps i think it's easier to raise a small amount of money and then raise more and a success than to raise loads of money and then have to raise even more money but on a, on a down there as it were thank you maybe should move on thank you So hopefully um, Will, Ed and Matt have given you a flavour for what it's like to work in the private sector and now we're kind of switching tack to um, Colin Miles who I'm sure quite a few of you in the audience know Colin already, who works with BBSRC uh, and Daniel Firth who works for the Institute of Chemical Engineers. If you don't know BBSRC, being as how you're sponsored by the NIPS come here, you're probably in the wrong room and you might want to step out. But so first of all, we have a call and hopefully these guys are doing it as a double act. So we have one slot with two gentlemen speaking. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. All right, so I, um, Daniel and I, double act here. Um, we unfortunately sit between you and lunch at the moment, which is a very comfortable thing to do. So we try and move this on reasonably quickly. We are going to, well, at least I'm going to be here for two days, so if there are things that you need to ask, etc., etc., or clarifications, very happy to take those points. Okay? So I'm just clicking then? Yeah? Okay. So let me introduce myself first of all. My name is Colin Miles. I'm Head of Strategy for Industrial Biotechnology and Bioenergy, um, and I work for an organisation called UK Research and Innovation, and particularly the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences component of it. I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. Um, I wasn't going to dwell too long on my own career because I've been at research councils for a fair amount of time. And if you read my entry in the in the in the document that you've got, you'll see that I've worked in a, in a very, really wide range of different areas. And I'm not going to try and recite any of those areas because they're so numerous. But the thing I would say is that I had absolutely no idea about the science behind any of them when I first began working in those areas. Okay. But the important thing is here is that working for the research councils and other stakeholders, there's a huge range of science to get involved in if you really want to, and it's massively rewarding to do so. Don't expect to be an expert in all of the things, though, because the range is so great, you can't do it. Okay? But there is, of course, a group of people in the organisation who will help you to get comfortable in the organisation about the science in which you're dealing with. So that's the first, first important point. Okay? Second important point is UK research and innovation. Okay, so this is a, a way in which the government has brought together science in all of its aspects, and it was launched in April 2018. It's this new funding organisation, and it's seven research councils, Innovate UK, the government's agency for supporting the business community, and Research England that supports um, universities in England, and we all work together now as part of a partnership and a team in this organisation called UK Research and Innovation. So it's anticipated that it will do what it says on the tin, which is bring people together and allow certain things to happen. But also, it's the way in which we envisage the representation of science to government. So we're expecting the government to take much more notice of science as a consequence. Now, for someone in their position in their career, like me, it might just be another reorganisation of the way in which the government supports science. But for you, it's all very, very different. This is one of the most profound reorganisations of science that we are likely to have in the, in the forthcoming years. Okay? And the opportunities for you will be profoundly significant in terms of the way in which the government supports science. So the opportunities are there. 
you need to wait for them to manifest themselves, but they will be open to you. So that's a really positive note to start on. So if I move on then and talk about BBS, I'll see a component part now with UK research and innovation. What does it do? Well, it invests in world-class bioscience in universities and institutes. It supports training and skills, and we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. It supports the widest range of societal and economic impact in its research, and it promotes public dialogue of bioscience research. So four key things that the organisation gets involved in. And we have a portfolio of research projects at the moment. There's a responsive portfolio where scientists send their best ideas to us and we review them and support them through grants. And then there's a more directed or managed approach which we have involving strategic science priorities. So you can see food security, bioscience for health and industrial biotechnology are the key ones that are being chosen. I get to be the head of sector for industrial biotechnology and bioenergy. And it's those areas, if you like, that I'm going to talk about a little bit about next. So if you work for BBSLC, but this is, could be true of any of the research councils currently working in, in UKRI, there are four areas that I've identified that you're most likely to be involved in if you come and work for the organisation. And I'm going to talk about the first two, in the matter of time really more than anything else. And what I'm going to do in those areas is try and identify what it's all about so you get a feeling for what it looks like. Also, you get a feel for, I hope, what it would be like if you came to work for the organisation, the types of things that you'd be doing in that role, and also um, what types of skills are required to be able to do that role successfully. Okay, so let's move on then, because I know you weren't kept on. Yeah, okay. Let's move on. So let's talk about the peer review system. So grants are the principal means by which the government funds scientific research. Okay? In order to get government money into your lab, it requires a grant. So let's talk about how fundamentally important that grants are in the way in which science is supported in the future. Okay? So we normally support grants through a grant round. So when we um, organise a grant round, we receive a batch of grant proposals. And we have staff working in teams that actually are responsible for conducting the peer review. And that's used to determine which grants that we support and which grants are the highest quality, the ones that likely receive funding, and those which are, of relatively speaking, lesser quality, and the applicant might need to try down. We have a computer-based system, so it's entirely electronic these days, to manage the proposals and the use of external referees who are responsible for conducting the peer review of those proposals. And the meeting, uh, sorry, the, the process concludes with a meeting of scientific <coughs> peers that actually result in the scoring and ranking of those proposals. And then we are responsible for providing feedback to those who don't get grants and of course grants and grant funding to those people who are successful. So that's what the peer review, that's what the process looks like <coughs> in simple terms. So if you came to work for BBSLC, but this would also be true of the other research councils, what type of, you know, what would you get to do in that role? So firstly, we'd be asking you to use your scientific knowledge and expertise to determine which applications that are being made are eligible to cover the content of work relevant to the council, like BBSLC, for example. So non-medical biosciences, if you like. We would ask you to use your expertise to select reviewers, and to ensure that appropriate reviews have been made. And as part of a team, you will get to lead the operations and the process, and you'll get the responsibility of looking after approximately 100 proposals, and that might be up to three times a year, it may even be more. And then, of course, you get the responsibility of preparing for and participating in peer review meetings, and actually keeping a record of what the decisions were. Okay, so quite a bit of responsibility there. And you get to do that for normal responsive, but also some of those managed activities that we talked about under industrial biotechnology and agriculture, food security and bioscience for health. So that's the type of thing that you would get to do. So what do you think the skills are, what do I think the skills are rather, that require you to do that successfully? If you want to do that successfully, what do you think is needed for that? So I think careful time management is actually really important. So people who are able to plan and project what they're going to be doing. And working on grants can in fact be quite hard work. 
there is an element of attention to detail as well, particularly in terms of the finance. The finance is very difficult to reverse once you put it through a particular process. So attention to detail in that area is really important. And so too, as we've heard from other speakers, good interpersonal skills and the ability to work in teams is really important. And particularly, working with members of the scientific community, you will be expected to run meetings which involve people from the academic, business, government, and third sectors to come along to your meetings, and you'd expect to be, to, to be knowledgeable and polite to them. Uh, and just remember that some of those people may end up being your supervisors in the future, or they may be colleagues from the past. You know, it wouldn't be the first time that that's happened. All right, so just remember that, that those soft skills that we talked about, they are really important to make this, this process work effectively. So the final area we're going to talk about now is scientific strategy and the innovation process. So what's this all about? Well, it's about working in those strategic areas that I've highlighted and understanding what role BBSRC has in those areas. Clearly, in the area of health, which we share with the Medical Research Council and the Wellcome Trust, we would have a very different role to one where, in industrial biotechnology, for example, we are the principal funder. So it's actually learning more about how your organisation fits, what the grant portfolio looks like, and what do you think the current trends are, and how is the area developing, and advising BBSLC about how it should respond. And then, of course, identifying mechanisms and ways forward about how we're going to deal with those new trends, if you like. So sometimes that might be alone, sometimes that might be in partnership with another organisation. And then it's working with those grants teams to deliver the areas either managed or responsive mode. So that's what's involved. What would you get to do if you came to work in this area? Well, we'd look at the grant portfolio. We'd expect you to be able to review grant portfolios. We'd expect you to work with other stakeholders and coordinating scientific support. And in mem with members of the community again to be able to develop the areas further. And also working with mechanisms to be able to implement science, if you like. And increasingly, I'd say, that this is in being undertaken in what I call an international context. So we're increasingly we're working with other countries, not necessarily just European, but now worldwide. So you might need to dust off your passport or get it renewed very quickly if you come and work for the research councils. Skills, in order to do this effectively, well, certainly interpreting large quantities of data, particularly grants data. We've heard a little bit about data. Uh, already so far. And I think what's more important, rather than looking at what's there, is actually looking about what's missing. So the missing pieces are actually very important in terms of what you're going to do next. Working with those scientific and business and government and third sector communities, and remember, there's nothing logical about the way in which science gets supported in the UK, so don't go thinking that, that logic applies here. You've got to be comfortable with ambiguities and uncertainties about the way things are going to work and how they might work in the future too. So don't, be, don't think that it's going to be quite a sweetness and light and linear. It's anything but. Then, of course, it's working with different teams uh, and often internationally too. And then there's the part where you have to be a little bit patient. So when the research is being undertaken, to keep in touch with what's going on with your researchers and look for the outcomes and think about how that might be better exploited. So having an evaluation plan associated with all of the science. Right, so that's me. Daniel, over to you. Thank you, Colin. Um, right, so my name is Daniel Firth, I'm a policy officer at ICME. Uh, I had a quick question, so most of your PhD students, who's in their second year, final year, writing up? Okay, because approximately a year ago, that was the stage I was at. So I've only been working at ICME for a year as a policy officer. Before that, I was doing my PhD. Uh, so. I graduated, I hope everyone knows about PhD comics, so I've, I've stolen this image. Uh, so I graduated with a Master's in Chemistry in 2013. Um, I then actually did a PhD in Inorganic Chemistry, so uh, please don't shoot me right now. Uh, and 
I did that from September 2013 to November 2016, which is then when I decided to write up, but I made a decision to apply for jobs while I was writing up. And it was at that point that I actually got offered the role in July, and I was still editing my thesis. Um, I actually submitted in August, finally, and then I did my Viva, did all the corrections by November, and then I graduated in December. So by Christmas, I was about ready to sort of collapse in a pool of my own blood, sweat, tears, and coffee. Um, so I work for, I've been working at iCME now for a year. So iCME is a professional membership organization. We represent 40,000 40, members from across uh, the globe. And we are an institution that's uh, led by members, supporting members, and also serving society. Now, what does that mean? So our aims are to build a professional community and foster uh, excellence and deliver the benefits of that excellence to society. So we're the only institution that can award the, uh, the title of Chartered Chemical Engineer. And um, that's a peer review process where essentially your skills as a chemical, biochemical, bioprocess, process engineer are recognized by other members in your field. Um, we also aim to promote the development and understanding of chemical engineering and its appreciation of its importance. We also try to provide support for our members and uh, help them with improving their technical expertise, but also in improving the knowledge of how their skills in chemical engineering are applied in other sectors. Um, and probably one of the most important points with regards to my job is to enable chemical engineers to communicate with each other, but also with other disciplines and other key stakeholders like government, non-NGOs, and uh, research councils. And that's where really the staff at iChemy are probably involved. Uh, so within our institution, probably the entry level jobs you're looking at will probably be working in publications as a policy officer like myself, or in the membership and qualifications team. Um, we also have, perhaps if people are interested, we also have a, ma a magazine, so if you're interested in science communication as well, that's something else that the institution would do. Outside of iChemy, there are other roles such as data analysts, policy advisors within the civil service as well, and also you might be interested in sales and marketing. Um, so what are the key skills that you need for a role? Uh, once again, stealing an image. Uh, so really is all about transferable skills. I did not uh, do a PhD and in, in inorganic chemistry and uh, well, I did do it, but I'm now not using those skills, really. I'm, I'm not using my knowledge of zeolites. I'm not using any of that. I'm using the key transferable skills that I've learned. So, as Colin already said, you won't be an expert in your field. The whole point of iChemy when it comes to policy is you're collecting the knowledge that the members have, putting it into a coherent statement, document, report, and then presenting that to society to help improve the decisions that people are making. So you have to just accept that you're going to have a constant sense of imposter uh, syndrome. You're, you're not going to be uh, the expert in what you're actually dealing with. But you have learned the skills to research and analyze. So you, you're not going to go into any, when I actually do a policy statement or something, something like that, I'm going to actually have uh, the, I'm going to actually put in the effort to actually research the topic so that I have a basic understanding of what's going on and I have a better understanding of what the individuals who are going to be giving me information are actually going to be uh, talking about. Um, and in that case, that's where you are also required to not just identify the evidence that the members are giving you, but also you need to identify where perhaps the personal opinions are coming in. Uh, for example, we've done a few uh, responses to inquiries on Brexit and as I'm sure you can imagine, when you have a group of about 16 people, there are some people who are on one side of the argument who are saying that 
Britain doesn't need to worry about you know, whatever the issue is. And then there are others who are very much of the opinion that Britain should stay within the EU and that the referendum was the worst mistake the country has ever made. You've got to actually learn to try and get past those opinions and actually boil down what they're saying to the actual evidence and the actual information that is coming across and then put that into a document. So when it comes to that, it's excellent communication skills. You need to know who your audience is. You need to know how to structure your document well for that audience. And you need to actually have a good writing style. So um, obviously these are all skills that during your PhD you've kind of learned how to do. You've learned how to do presentations, posters, write papers. You, you do have the skills. It's just making sure that you know that you can apply those in this respect. And probably the biggest thing is time and pro project management. Uh, I'm managing sort of two bigger projects, but if something comes out of the blue, for example, if the white paper that we just saw, if we decide to do a response to that, then I'm going to have to rejig my priorities and change the timelines of all my projects that I'm actually managing at the moment to take, into, take that into account. And with regards to the policy specific uh, aspects, you need to learn how to manage volunteers and, and other stakeholders, so make sure that you can network well with them, communicate with them well, and manage their time, because our members, their main role is not within ICME, they're doing it out of the goodness of their hearts, working with us, so you have to make sure that you uh, make yourself as available as possible to work well with them. Uh, and then, obviously, probably um, the most important thing is having an interest and understanding of policy. Uh, you probably won't have a full knowledge, but most uh, stakeholders like ourselves are looking for people who are actually interested in policy. So they actually have sort of an idea of how government works, but you, you don't necessarily know sort of every single detail of laws that are currently going through Parliament, etc. So what attracted me to the role? Uh, in 2012, I was sort of starting my final year and actually had a presentation from the Royal Society of Chemistry. And they did a presentation where one of the uh, talk, uh, speakers was talking about the role that scientists have in policy. When you look at Parliament itself, uh, I think currently there are about 100 MPs of about 660, something like that, who have an interest in science, technology, engineering, medicine, maths. Now, when you look at that, that does sound like a lot, but that's a very broad range of topics. And when you look at some of the discussions that Parliament has to have on very technical issues, like the issue we have with mitochondrial DNA, uh, the issue of REACH, so regulations within, uh, with regards to chemicals, they're not going to have the technical expertise, and so they need to actually be informed. And the whole point of roles like uh, policy officers at the ICME, uh, at the RSC, and also with civil servants at the House of Parliament, uh, Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. It's about creating that content to inform them quickly and also make sure that the information they're getting is of a good quality. So uh, during my PhD, I did apply for a couple of fellowships. I applied for one sponsored by ICME. I didn't get it, but then there was a position advertised by ICME. So perseverance pays off because I got that position. Uh, so that's one thing I would say is definitely always persevere. And right now, what I'm looking at is uh, there's two big projects, Biofutures and UK Research. So what they're looking at is trying, the Biofutures project is looking at making ICME more relevant for people working in the bio sector. Uh, so in regards to that, we're looking at skills, careers, SMEs, policy, and it's all about internal matters. So it's about how ICME can improve its chartership process for biochemical engineers, how um, it can better showcase the career opportunities you have, etc. And then with regards to the UK Research Committee, that's kind of a gathering of members who work um, at universities and other research institutions, and the idea of that group is to highlight the chemical engineering research excellence that there is in the UK and about pushing that towards uh, making sure that, that is um, received by interested parties like government, like the research funding bodies. So there's some other policy work which you might do which uh, 
involves coordinating part responses to parliamentary inquiries. So those things are quite sudden, they'll pop up. I did one on, uh, for the institution on Brexit and energy security. Um, and then also we do a bit of work with regards to equality, diversity and inclusion. So the work is varied. You're going to be writing uh, a lot of different formats, so blogs, policy documents, reports, press statements. You also have to do host workshops and discussion panels and meetings. Um, it's always engaging, I find, because you get to work with a really good group of people. So you work with uh, people who are at uh, research funding institutions, you're working with CEOs of companies, you're working with students. Uh, I get to work with quite a few uh, interesting people, so I always find it's engaging uh, to work with those people. On the other flip side, it sometimes can be frustrating, and that's where the volunteer management aspect really comes in. You're going to be working with volunteers who don't necessarily have time, and so you have to, uh, it requires a certain amount of patience and a certain amount of diplomacy. It's not about, as uh, we did have a picture and a quote from JFK, it's not about what they can do for you, but what I can do for them to make life easier for them to actually contribute to the work. So um, that, that's a key sort of skill and a bit of nuance there. So if you are actually looking for sort of a career with regards to um, policy, um, or other aspects like that. There are, for example, 35 professional engineering institutions, so not just uh, ICME. Um, you can also look at other learned societies. You can look at journals and publishing, funding bodies, think tanks, NGOs and charities, regulators, and the civil service. So really, if you're not, if you're not looking for a career in academia and industry, just know that there are a lot of options out there, and you your PhD skills, that you, your transferable skills that you have will actually work well in all of these uh, organizations. Um, specifically, I probably wanted to mention, just because I uh, applied for internships, etc., to try and push, uh, try and get some experience. Uh, at the moment, the UKRI does actually have some policy officer internships for PhD students who are funded by UKRI funding bodies. You can also look at the Parliamentary Office of Science Technology's website because they do uh, four-month uh, internships uh, with different joint with uh, different organisations like ICME, like EPSRC, uh, and you can also look for job opportunities. Um, I'd probably recommend CASE, which is Campaign for Science, uh, Technology, and, uh, Science and Engineering. Um, also, there is uh, I could probably talk other people in more detail, but there is a sort of emailing list which is called SciCom, and what they do is a lot of people will advertise jobs for a, a lot of different roles, so science communication, so that can be policy, journals, um, and sort of magazine articles, etc. Um, one thing I would say is if it interests you, always ask. Uh, my friend was interested in publishing, there wasn't a role on offer, but she did actually send them a uh, an inquiry email and she actually got offered a position out of that. So I would say definitely always be ready to ask someone if they'd be interested in you, but also be very open-minded about where you go, because it's not, there's a lot of options out there. It's not just one straight sort of run. So I think that's it for me. Yeah. <laughs>